Let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for your love for us, Father. And we um, just give you glory and honor and praise. We ask for your strength and guidance through these difficult times, Father. We pray that this COVID crisis would be brought to an end and that freedom would, would once again reign and that we would be wise. Uh, we would be wise with our, our actions and behaviors, Father. Father, we also ask tonight as we study your word that all of the electronic devices that we're using would, would remain, would do their part, that we'd have no failure, that the electricity would stay on, that the internet would remain strong. Father, I pray that you'd bind the work of Satan. He is the, 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 the being who wants to destroy. He wants to seek and destroy, Father. He wants to prevent EVST and also CGST and just these uh, uh, this uh, learning experience. Father God, I pray that you would prevent him from doing this. I pray that you would keep all of our signals strong, that we could have this discussion. I pray that we would uh, work through these the spiritual warfare as there's so much uh, striving and that you would just give us perseverance. And we ask and, and, and we ask for the coming of your son. May, may your son come quickly. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Okay, so... By God's grace, we will not have any lags or delay. We are trusting in technology to make this happen, but I'm excited. We, we, you know, I think we're slowly developing and I'm really excited about the future of what we have. So welcome again to Biblical Theology, the blossoming of God's revela revelation from Adam to Christ. Tonight is going to be, I hope and trust and pray, a, a great cliffhanger uh, um, a learning. I've, I've been learning so much myself. So, okay, here we go. Okay, great. So our partners, just a reminder that our partners, uh, Cebu Graduate School of Theology, Eastern Visayas School of Theology, and Converge, uh, Converge U.S., and then also many of you are also Converge Philippines, so we could include that there. Um, and so we're just so thankful for those that are making this happen. And we are on to session number nine, the mode and content of special revelation from uh, in the patriarchal period, and this is going to be from uh, special revelation during the patri patriarchal period, and so we're on to part two, okay, we're on to part two, and uh, just a, a brief overview of the session tonight, we will have a uh, discussion of the notes and also the scripture explanation, and we're going deep tonight, I hope that uh, that it'll be a blessing for you, and then we'll also have a small breakout room if there's time for you to just to discuss what we've been learning. And so tonight is a foundational class for, um, for Revelation, especially during the patriarchal period. I, I hope and trust that you will see that. So now we're on to chapter seven. We've already done part of chapter seven. We started it, and so we're going to finish it tonight. So I'm just going to quickly review, the, just kind of talk through the PowerPoint. I won't spend a lot of time, but I'll talk through the PowerPoint and if you have a question, you can, but maybe during this review, we can just save the questions until we start with the new content. And so uh, history of Revelation, and we are in the mode and content of the Old Testament, and we're focusing right now on the patriarchal period. And t t last week, we discussed the uh, historicity of the patriarchs, how important the, the historical nature, the reality of the patriarchs are, that that's the foundation of our faith in, in a real objective way. Voss brings that out. Uh, we also discussed the the mode and the mode of revelation the patriarch. So the mode is is now diff, is 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 different. It is possible for us to say it's more specific. It's become more specific. More there's been clarity there, and so uh, we'll discuss that further tonight, or we'll we'll review that tonight. Um, and then number three is the content of revelation. So we'll be discussing these. So it's the introduction we already have, the mode will continue, and then the content as well. Okay, so historicity of, of the patriarchs, just by way of review, it's not a small issue. This is something that we need to take very seriously. We need to be aware that this is that these debates are coming from the US. They ultimately came from, uh, originally came from Europe. And so this is a way that our faith is being attacked. And so we need to be very aware of that. Voss and B.B. Warfield were very, uh, they fought on this issue. And so now it's coming back again in evangelicalism. A hundred years ago with Voss, it was in academia. Now it's in our churches. 
And so the, the patriarchs teach us more than simple religious and moral lessons. There's an objectivity, uh, there is reality. It, it is not only the history of revelation that we see, but also the history of redemption. The two are inseparable. And so these are real actors in the drama of redemption. We always need to really focus and, and, and keep our minds fixed and set upon that. If they are real, that gives assurance to us that what, are, what is promised to us is also real. If God is faithful to his promises to the patriarchs, he will be faithful to us. If it's just a figment of, of, of myth, if it's just a story, there isn't really a lot of assurance right? There's, there's not really a lot of assurance because like, it's a story, but we don't know if it's really, if we don't know, we don't know if the promises are, are really, uh, they're not real for them. So maybe they're not so real for us. So there's really a, a connection there with the, the reality. And then um, uh, Voss brings out that the people of God uh, in the patriarch stories, historical narratives, we see the first embodiment of objective religion, the nucleus of the church, that is the people of God. So this is really the, the, the objective foundation. You have it even, you have those, you have the echoes of it, the, the types, the prototypes prior to the patriarchs, but this is really where it becomes, uh, it, it becomes clear, becomes explicit. So last week we looked at two passages, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. And also Genesis 15. And I do want to apologize to, to Pastor Henry. Last week he had brought up uh, especially faith. And I had said from the hold on the faith component, I was more focusing on the, 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 the principles of probation, life, tempt, temptation, testing. But I had brought up these different themes prior to the study. So I want to apologize to Henry. Henry was spot on in his observation concerning faith, concerning election. And, and, I, and I was more focused on those other principal forms. But in this lesson, in, in the patriarch's life, we see these principles here. And so uh, I do want to apologize to Henry because he was really tracking. And I, maybe you were confused when I was like, well, maybe, maybe you're confused. I, I really apologize for that. that. That was my mistake. I was so focused on just the background. I missed what he was trying to say. So uh what we were look, what we look for in these two passages, and we'll continue to do so in, in the passages tonight, are revelation, the mode and content. We're looking at election. So we are really going to discuss election tonight. Election is real. I want you to see it in the text. It's there. It's present. It's, it's present already. We saw, but we're going to see it even, even more explicit in Genesis chapter 18. So be looking for it. We're also looking at uh, the objectivity of gifts. So the gifts, the promises that were given to, to, um, uh, to, to the patriarchs, they're real. The gifts are real. This goes hand in hand with, with um, uh, redemption. The objectivity of the gifts, they're real. The gifts, the promises are real. It's not a story. It's not, uh, they're tangible. They're, they're, it's, it's non-negotiable. These are not things that can be revoked. Paul also talks about that in the New Testament. Um, we also will look at, we did look at a little bit, we'll look at more tonight, the supernatural activity of and fulfillment. We will look at the subjective transformed life. So Jacob is an example of a transformed life. We look where we will look at the name of the Lord. Also this idea of faith, persevering faith, ethical elements, and also sacrifice. So, uh, that's a lot. That's a lot tonight. I have, I have lofty goals. I've had my tea. I've had my, my, my sugar. So hopefully we'll get through all of this, but this is so important. We're lit. We're on a time crunch here, but this is, these things are, this is the foundation. So we also really saw the principles laid out in, in Genesis one to 11. Now we're going to see objective religion unfold before our eyes and we will see this in the lives, lives of the patriarchs and so these things are present and they are just expanded upon in the new testament they're expanded upon and further revealed so what i want us to see is that when we come to the new testament we see we see morality we see faith we see the name of of the lord we see the trinity further revealed we see ethical elements and even the, the eternal sacrifice 
What we cannot say is that, oh, this is new events or, or a new revelation. Rather, it's a further, it's just a, a further revealing of what was already there. I, I want everyone to be really clear on that. The history of revelation, the history of redemption, everything was already planned by God from the beginning. He's just slowly revealing it to us and he's taking steps to bring it about. So that is, I, maybe that's foundational or revolutionary for you. It's revolutionary for me, but we don't want to say it's, it's new or a different plan. We don't want to say it's new or something different from the Old Testament. Okay. That's really important. And, and Paul, we, we looked at that. We looked at that. Um, some examples in the New Testament for that. Okay, so we talked about theophany, that is God appearing, literally God appearing. And we, we, we talked about how the promised land in some ways is like the Garden of, of Eden. It's a place where God meets with the patriarchs in spe specific locations and communi communes and fellowships with them. And so uh, uh, there is, he comes to the patriarchs though in a specific mode and he gives specific content as revelation is revealed. There's also an increase of frequency of these revelations, but they're also very restricted. So God is not revealing himself to all of humanity. He's very specific. It's much more sacred, it's set apart, it's private, it's guarded. And so this speaks all the more to the, the blessing that we have in Christ. Some of the characteristics that we talked about, location, there, it's really limited to, to a specific locations. It's also, uh, it's also limited with reference to time. He appears only in the evening. Also in the mode, there's specific mode that we're going to see. And, and the one that I want to highlight tonight will be the, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the appearing of the angel of the Lord. And, and the mediation is through this angel of the Lord. So who is the angel of the Lord? Is it just an angel? Is it Christ? Is it something else? connected with God himself. Okay, so um, now we're going to expound upon the angel of the Lord. And I just want to make some, some introductory statements. The angel of the Lord distinguishes himself from Jehovah, speaking of him in the third person. But then in other instances, it's as if he is God himself speaking. Okay, so let's, let's take a pause from the PowerPoint. And let's go ahead and let's look at the passage. So turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 18. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 16, verses 7. Genesis chapter 16, verses 7 to 14. All right, so I'm going to read the text first, then we're going to highlight some things. So right now we're looking at, we're not looking at everything that there is to say. We, we can't discuss everything, but I want us to look at the issue of what, what we're focusing on right now is the angel of the Lord, and we're looking at identity. Who is the angel of the Lord? Okay, so we're focusing right now on the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water. So speaking about Hagar, Hagar has just fled from Abraham. And so she's at the spring of water in the wilderness. She's going to watch her child die. In the wilderness, the spring on the way to shore. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. The angel of the Lord also said to her, Behold, you are pregnant, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over and against his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. She said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well is called Ber Leroy, it lies between Kadesh and Barad. What I want us to see here is we're focusing on this angel of the Lord. Okay, so we're focusing right now on the angel of the Lord. And so you see here, he is the one speaking. So he, 
he speaks. And maybe you notice this in your reading, maybe in, in your scripture, in your scripture um, reflection report. And so coming down here, he gives a command. So these two here, these are commands. Right? This is also a command. And so at this point, we don't know. It's just, it seems to be just an angel. There, there's multiple references here. The angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. He said, so this is the one who is speaking. Now watch this. Look at what he says here. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered. So this here, does the angel of the Lord have the power to do this? What, what does this sound like? Who does this sound like? This, this promise here sounds like who? Where does it, what does this sound like? It is still God who, who is speaking. Yes, that is correct. It's God that's speaking. But so, so Henry, the question I, I, I'm asking is, what other, what other person had a promise similar to this? Oh, it's similar to Isa. Yeah, so this is similar to, uh, this is similar to... Abraham, yeah. yeah Abraham, it, uh, offspring to Isa. Abraham offspring, uh, uh, God's promise to Abraham then to his son, Isa. Yeah, th this, is, this is similar. It's similar, right? It sounds the same. In, in those statements, who is the I? In those other statements, who is the I, Henry? I that is God. Yeah. The first I, I will surely multiply that is God. Yeah. So I hope everyone can start to see the, the difficulty here. So what we have here is we have a, we have a promise. And, and the, the I, the I is God, Diba. But look, look here. It's the angel of the Lord that's speaking. So does everyone see the difficulty here? It seems to be here that this is equating with the I and God. So in this statement here, the angel of the Lord seems to be God himself. Is everyone tracking with me? That's making sense. That's making sense. Exegetically, this is, this is what's happening. Okay. Everyone tracking there with me. But then you come down here again. The angel of the Lord again is speaking. For those of you who just came in, just we're, we're looking at the identity of the angel of the Lord. So we just had a review. We, we, we just started the new content. And so we're looking at the identity of the Lord and specifically Voss's discussion on who is the angel of the Lord. Okay. So let's just take a, let's just take a quick review here for those who maybe missed it. Some people will say it's God himself. Others will say it is Christ. And then others will just say it's an angel speaking for God. Okay, so those are the options. Okay, so right here, looking down here, what we're, what we, the, 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 the statement that we've, we've highlighted here, the observation is that, is that the angel of the Lord is speaking as if he is literally God himself. Is everyone tracking with me? I, I hope everyone can see that. So he's literally speaking as if it's God himself. Okay, but then, but then here, there's some statements and notice what happens. Does everyone see the difficulty here? So this here now is it's like the, the third person. Whereas here it's the first person. 
So he speaks as if it's God himself, but then here it's like God is, he's speaking, God is, it's not God. It's, it's actually this angel. He's speaking on behalf of God. Everyone sees that? But then look down here. Look at how, look at how Hagar views the event. Look at how Hagar views the event. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. So she viewed it as God speaking, and then she addresses God in the second person. You. You are a God of seeing. So is everyone tracking with the difficulty, the conundrum here? Let's take a moment. I want everyone to be, be clear. Does everyone understand the difficulty and, and what's going on here? Does everyone see that? Yeah, I can see the difficulty. But if we separate angel and Lord, maybe it's more clear. Okay, so that's one possibility. Um, let's be thinking about that. Um, anyone else want to ask a question? I just want to make sure everyone is tracking with me. I, I want to make sure that no one is lost. Everyone sees the issue, okay? Voss has a solution, okay? Yeah, I, I yeah. think both solution is to consider the three as one and the same thing altogether. His presence, his name, etc. Yeah. They are one and the same thing. I think yeah, that's no, how I understood. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, according to him, his equation was... You cannot separate God from his name and from his appearance, whether it is as an angel or as what. Yeah, he yeah, cannot yeah. be detached from those yeah. things. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. I understood. Yeah, but but so this is where the rub gets in because also he, he, he gives a solution. But let me, let me read one other passage so that we really understand the rub, okay? So John, John chapter 1, verse 18 says, John 1 18, no one has ever seen God. <laughs> so that's the rub. That's the rub. How, how do we, how do we, how do we work that out? The, the, the only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. Okay. So that, that's the, the issue. Voss has a solution. And what Kuya Boboy said in a different place is really true that, that, Voss is bringing up the fact that you, when, when, when God says his name dwells there, it's his presence dwells there. So the name represents God. The word represents God. You can't separate these two out. There's different ways of describing God, but, it, but it's himself being there, okay? Now, there's many places in the Old Testament like this, especially in Exodus, in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, also in, 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 the, in the prophets as well. So this is one example of this, this issue continuing to, to, come, to come up, okay? The other, the other issue is what I read in John 1.18, that no one has ever seen God. So, so how do we do justice with the text? How do we take a high view of the text? How do we see, how do we also reconcile that with the fact that no one has ever seen God, okay? So let's, let's go back to the PowerPoint. And let's make, let's read what Voss has to say, and then we can discuss the solution, okay? There's different solutions, and so some people take a slightly different view. And so, um, you know, I follow Voss's view. I think Voss's view has, it, it's really good. I think that's the correct answer, but it's debated. And, and there's, I would say there's two positions you could take. So now we have, we have the issue. In the one hand, so this is what Voss says. In the one hand, it's as if the Lord himself is speaking. And then the other hand, it's a third person. Okay, so this is, let, let's talk through Voss for a minute here. We just examined Genesis 7, 14, uh, 16, 7 to 14. So this is what, John, John, uh, what, this is what Voss says. God is taking on physical form so that in one sense, it is God's very presence. It must be more than simply an angel speaking on behalf of God. So Voss is saying it's more than just merely an angel speaking on behalf of God because God is present. Hagar views it as God being present, okay? So there is some type of, of manifestation in a real, a very real sense in which God is appearing as an angel, a theophany, 
It's more than just an angel so that she feels his presence. He makes promises at the same time. It is not God because he also speaks in the Lord in the third person. Okay. Um, uh, yet it is not literally God as John 118 emphatically declare, declares that no one has seen God. So what we want to say, number one, is that the angel of the Lord, it is God himself, his presence, but it's not his being in, in a literal sense, for God is spirit, okay? So is everyone tracking? That's the first thing that we can say that's being fair to the text, because even in the text, it, 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 the angel also speaks as if God is a third, in, in the third person. So we're being consistent so far. This has led some to believe, this has led some to believe that this is simply a pre-incarnate Christ, okay? So the angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate Christ. I, I've held that position in the past. If you hold that, if you hold to that position, that's within uh, th that's with that's that's a good position to take. Okay, I think Wayne Grudem offers this as a possibility. Okay, so it's it's a good position. That's one solution. Okay, but that's not Voss's solution, and I'm going to explain why in a second. Okay, so this is what Voss says. He says there's two things that we have to hold in tension. Okay, number one, there's a sacramental intent. Remember. A sacrament is a physical manifestation of, of the reality of the promise or the reality of something behind the scenes, okay? So it's not in a, in a bad Catholic sense, okay? We understand, so there's this, sacra, this sacramental intent of the angel of the Lord. We understand the desire for God to approach closely to his people to assure them in the most manifest way of his interest in and his presence with them. Secondly, there's a spiritual intent, uh, the spiritual nature of God is preserved as, as its background. And this was accomplished by conveying the impression that behind the angel, uh, God is speaking. The angel is speaking as God who embodied in himself all the condescension of God to meet the frailty and limitations of man. There existed another aspect of God in which he could not be seen and materially received after such a fashion, the very God of whom the angel spoke in the third person, the spiritualizing intent was auxiliary to the sacramental one. The angel was truly divine, for otherwise he could not have discharged the sacramental function of assuring that God was with him. But the visible, physical form of meeting this need is not due to the nature of God. So is everyone tracking there with me? So there's, there's a spiritualizing intent. It's not literal. Okay, so there is a real sacramental intent. God is present with the angel of the Lord. But it's spiritual. It's not it's not literally, it's in this, in this intent, it's not literally God himself. Does everyone making sense there? So there is an analogy, there is an analogy to, there is an analogy that we could make to Christ, but yet distinct. So, so, so in some way, God embodied himself in, in an angel to reveal himself. It's not just merely an angel, but it's not Christ himself. And the reason why we want to separate it from a pre-incarnate Christ is because Christ is going to come in the New Testament and Christ is going to come in the New Testament and he's going to be he's going to be distinguished from everything that came before and one of those things that came before was the angel of the Lord so even in the embodiment of Christ so we looked at this before in in Hebrews right in many in many times in many ways uh, God spoke, to the forefathers, through the prophets. In these last days, he has spoken to us through a son. Um, and then it describes who he is, right? And then he inherits a name that is greater than the angels, right? And then the whole rest of the Hebrews 1, 5 to 14 is how Jesus is better than the angels. And what I want to say there is that I, I do think the angel of the Lord can be included in that comparison, that all the angels that came before are inferior to to Christ. So I I, I do want to say that we want to we want to withhold a comparison of the Lord being embodied in the angel of the Lord in comparison with Christ. So that we couldn't say that oh Christ's coming is the same as the angel. Does, is, is, is that is that tracking? Is everyone tracking there with me? So Maybe that's confusing. Maybe you want to ask a question. So what I want to say is that the angel of the Lord is somewhat, it's higher than just a, a regular angel. It, it, 
it, it's it's a, it's an embodiment. It's an appearance of God Himself, but not literally, because God, no one has ever seen God. Okay, and it's not it's not Christ, but it, but but in many ways it is. It is higher than an angel. It represents God. It's it's an appearance of God, but it's distinct from the, the typical angels, and it's still inferior to the revelation, the coming, the incarnation of Christ. Although Voss will say there's a comparison between the two to be made. Does anyone does anyone want to add? Is everyone tracking there with me? Maybe it's, that's really, this is really confusing. I don't want to be confusing, but it's really important. Does, does someone want to, to, to make a comment or add or ask a question? Good boy. Okay. Maybe, maybe the seemingly confusion can be minimized if we consider that literally God does not uh, appear himself in the physical sense. And yes. uh, what John is saying that no one has seen God and live. So literally, yes, literally. Yeah, literally, that's literal. But there is also a context that God can be present in another sense. His presence yeah. is there. Yes, yes. And that is why yes. I think that's how I understood Bruce when he said, when the angel is there, God is also there. When yes, the name of yes. God is there, God is there. So yes. in whatever to me, in whatever way God appears, in theophany, in actual yeah. appearance, whatever is the mode, whatever is there, he is there. Yeah. Whether it is an angel that is physically appearing, is it a donkey that is physically appearing, or is it a, a wind that is appearing? The, the essence is God's presence is there. I think we can we can settle on that. Because yeah. we cannot see God in the in the physical sense. Yeah. Otherwise, no. the confusion yeah. will remain. Yeah, no, that's really good, Corey Boy Boy. Let's just let's just have that. Let's just ratchet up a little bit higher. So I agree with you there. I think so. There is also this special category of God revealing Himself through the angel when He actually speaks. So so let's let's let's. I think what what Corey Boy Boy said is excellent. That's what Voss is saying. And so we still want to make. So God's presence can be present in other angels, but the angel of the Lord, because sometimes the angel does not appear. I mean, he appears, but he's always speaking in the third person. Thus says the word. Thus says the, 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 the. Thus declares the word of God. There's many times where it's like that, but there's also these unique times where God appears as it, as as the angel of the Lord in a higher sense. So so. I don't know if that's making sense. Yeah. So we, we, we do want to withhold and all of that, but here's the thing, all of those ways, those are inferior to the coming of Christ. <laughs> so we can see different ways. So God, God, God reveals his glory in the cloud, the about the cloud and the fire. That was God's presence, but that, that's even inferior to the Christ. Okay. So we want to, we want to see all these different ways. And I think that comes back to Hebrews chapter one being reading this through the lens of Hebrews chapter one, not through the lens, but with the understanding of Hebrews ch chapter one is, is just so il illuminating. Okay, great. Anyone else want to add or make a comment? Okay. Hey, and, how, about, yeah. how about the angel of the Lord, the, the, the angel of the Lord who visited, uh, who visited Lot? I think there too, it's, 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 it's so it says that the, I think, I think there is the presence of the, of God there because there it's also first and third person. People will talk about it being like a Trinitarian, but because it'll say the Lord called from the Lord fire. So it's like, I think in that, in that context, it's also reference to the, I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure that that's another instance where it's the angel of the Lord. It's more than just an angel. It's, it's God's, it's the, the angel, the angel of the Lord in this sense, the, the presence of God. Double check me. But so th the way we can know is that if the angel is sometimes speaking in the first person, but he doesn't say the Lord declares and then speaks, he just starts speaking. It goes the first person. And then it's things that God does. We would, we would reserve it for that category. So, so be looking for those things, just like we did in that example, where you can see it clearly being a first person and then a third person. Yeah. Uh, lastly. Yeah. About after resurrection, Jesus was walking with the two disciples to him out. They yeah. did not recognize Jesus. Yeah, because he's in the he's already the exalted. He's already the Superman. He's already the transformed. In one sense, they couldn't recognize him, so he's been transformed in the resurrected, incorruptible, eternal body. But in another sense, they could. 
right? So once they realized, they're like, oh, it was him. It's almost like, yeah, it's almost like looking back 30 years, right? Looking back 30 years at your picture, it's like, remember the picture you sent me? It's like, oh, there's Henry. But if you had not told me Henry was in the picture, I would not have recognized him. I would not have recognized him. It's true. It's, it's like looking at Henry with, with complete hair. Yes, that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But in, but in the resurrected Christ, we have the pattern of the new creation of the transformed bodies that we will have. He can, he can go through walls. He can, it's like he's totally different, but then he's still eating food. So because he's physical, he's forever the God man. He's forever a human. We will be resurrected. We will not fly around like angels the rest of our lives. When we are resurrected anew, we will, we will have a new transformed body. Hopefully I have hair. That, that's my hope. Good. Okay. Anyone else? We have we have to go on. We're, 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 time is flying from us. Anyone else? Anyone else want to make a quick comment before we go on? That's How about the same That's word that used in Exodus when when during the you know in the burning bush? Yeah. Says that the angel of the Lord appeared yeah. to Moses in the burning yeah. bush. Yeah. And no, it that seems yeah. like uh, it's it's the Lord Himself who really. Uh, appeared to Moses in the morning bush, but uh, the angel of the Lord, again, uh, appears the word angel of the Lord. So, so if you look in Ross's comments that he references Exodus there, I think he actually refer references Exodus 3. So everything we're just saying here applies there. And that's actually a stronger case, Sonny, as to why we need to see the angel of the Lord as more than just an angel. That's why I'm saying like, it's really important that we, we see a further distinction from angels that bring messages from God and the angel of the Lord that reveals himself, reveals God's presence to, to special persons in the Old Testament through redemption history. So that, that would be a great observation, and that would be even a stronger case. Right now, we're just looking at one example, but that would be a stronger case for that argument. Yeah. So, so we, don't want to, we don't want to see it as a, a Christophany per se, although in revealing God, we're, we're also seeing Christ. But again, it's, it's, the, it's a unique revelation of of god in the old testament yeah good uh danny go ahead Did we, sir uh, the, oh sunny there is a pattern there, uh there's a pattern or in you know I, i'm not i'm not really known in hebrew writings but you know speaking of of hebrew literary style or you know presenting god in, in the way the, the the narrative uh you know structured or or pattern there's some kind of pattern like Angel of the Lord's, I don't know, maybe, maybe there is, or I don't know, need, need a further studies on, on that. Yeah, I wouldn't say there's a pattern. It's just that's one of the ways he reveals himself. That, that, so we're looking at different ways that God is slowly revealing himself. And one of those ways is through the, is through the angel of the Lord in a technical sense, not other angels like Gabriel. It's not Michael, it's not Gabriel, okay? But it's because angel means messenger. So it's, it, it, it's it's not the Lord, it's a messenger, but he's, he is revealing God to man in a physical manifestation that's higher than other angels, that's higher than, than the cloud, that's higher than other modes, but it's still uh, inferior to, to the incarnation of Christ. So I don't want to say the angel of the Lord is Christ. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Bull Boy, yeah. clear Bull Boy and then Danny. Yeah. One thing I notice, uh, Tim, whenever this appearance of angel is recognized by men, whether it with the time of Abraham uh, and the others, how come they are able to recognize that it is God? Maybe just like maybe it's an angel or whatever is the appearance, but how come they are able to acknowledge this is God? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Sometimes they get it wrong, right? So in so John in Revelation, he like tries to start worshiping the angels. Like, no, you, I'm a servant just like you. Worship God. So, so sometimes they get it wrong. You know, I, I think, I, I think that whenever there's that revelation, even an, an angel is bringing the name of the Lord. He's bringing the word of God. So, so whether it's God Himself or a messenger, they're still recognizing. So it would be like it would be like President Duterte sending a messenger to me. 
you know, I'm not, oh, it's just a messenger. I was thinking it's, wow, Duterte is thinking about me. So it's, it's, so it's maybe along those lines. Um, maybe the, the appearance is different. Maybe the appearance is different, Koya Bull Boy. Maybe it's, it's even, it's, 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 it's even greater, you know? Yeah, it's hard to say. I don't know if the text really is clear on that. It's a great question. It's a really good question. Good to think about. Koya Danny, you had a question before we go on. Oops. Yeah, uh, I'm just a bit confused. Yeah. In verse 7 of Genesis 12, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, so how, what is the form of appearance of God to Abram? When he said, uh, it was said that God appeared to him. Yeah, so, so, so we can only go as far as the text takes us, right, Danny? We can only go as far as the text take, takes us. So there it's not clear how he appears. He could have appeared by the angel as the angel of the Lord. We don't, the text doesn't say that. So we know that he appeared in some type of physical form and he's speaking to Abraham. And that's the extent. So many times we are limited by what we are limited by what the text says. But in these instances where there is this angel of the Lord, we have more information and we need to be, we need to be uh in, in, in that sense, there is a pattern that Sonny met. In, in that sense, there's a pattern. So we need to be faithful to, to, to the text. So um, sometimes it's, because prior to Genesis 1 to 11, it doesn't describe how. We know that he could not have talked literally with man because no one has ever seen. So Adam's never seen man, God in his fullest sense. But the, the text is just vague. So we can't go further than what the text says. Yeah. I don't know if that's not an answer, but... Sorry. Yeah, last one. Yeah, go ahead. about the struggle between Jacob and the angels of the Lord, and then you know the the angel of the Lord uh, bless Jacob. Yeah. So so let's we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. So that's a little bit ahead of us. Um, but it would be similar to this. It would be similar to this. Um, Mark had actually asked a question prior to you, Sonny. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, yes, Pastor Dimam. Uh, where does the angel of the Lord fit in the Person yeah, so it's not, yeah, no, so, yeah, so we would not want to say that the angel of the Lord is with, is, is, is in the Trinity as a unique, all right, so at, at, in the Old Testament, Voss will bring this out, so this is really important why we need to read Voss over and over again, what he brings out is that, is that up until this time, God has only revealed himself as, as, uh, as one, God is one, okay, and so, the text is focus, although there's echoes, although there's there's in the background the, the the understanding of wow, this is this is Trinitarian. What's being highlighted, what's being focused is monotheistic. So what we would want to say is that um, the angel of the Lord is represented representing the Trinitarian God, not necessarily one. And I think Voss brings that out in the same way. But, but later, but later, the glory, the glory of the Lord, of, of God the Father, John will say, is in fact, and Jesus will say, it was in fact Jesus. So Isaiah six, the glory in the in the in the room that Isaiah sees is actually the glory of Jesus. So, so you have those 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 different things, but we don't. I, I would not want to make definitive it's the father it's the son it's the spirit because the text is not explaining that we we can't we can't that's just a, a question that's beyond our our ability we would just say that it's rep the, the angel of the lord is representing the presence of the trinitarian god um in a special unique way uh to his people or to people so in hagar hagar is not his people she ends up being outside but he revealed himself to her. Okay, is that is that good? Let, let's go on, Sonny. We'll, we'll 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 discuss your question towards the end. But I but just really short. It would be along the same lines. It's, it's the man wrestling is is clearly God Himself. He blesses him, so it would be along those lines. I don't think he's referred to as the angel of the Lord. So that would be another appearance of 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 God, um, but not as the angel of the Lord. Um, or at least not revealed by the text to be the angel of the Lord. So we would just define it as a, a, a theophany. The extent would be theophany. 
So now, now let me just come back here. So now we're on to, we looked at the different modes. So we have theophany, there's different modes. We looked at the, the time, location. And then we also looked at this special category of, of angel of the Lord. Now we're looking at the content. So Voss is going to give us nine significant things. Maybe you can make 10. I just left it with nine. Nine significant truths that's going to be a foundation that will be foundational for us, for our, um, that will be foundational for, for us as a religion, for us, and, and I'm using religion in a positive sense, not in a negative sense, uh, communion, relationship with God. And so there's going to be nine of these foundational that solidify religion as real and concrete with the patriarchs. Okay, so this and this is going to be the foundation of us. We're not in a different, we're not in a different religion than the patriarchs. Okay, <laughs> the gospel was preached to Abraham. Remember that if someone ever says, "Do you have a different?" You know, no. Abraham, the gospel was preached to Abraham. Abraham believed by faith. He is the father of us all. We will see that. Okay, so it's the same religion. All right. Um, the first thing is principle of election. So we are going to get into the hot. And debated election. Voss says, hitherto the race as a whole had been dealt with, or as in Noah's case, there had been election of a new race out of an old one given over to destruction. Here, one family is taken out of a number of existing Shemitic families, and with it, within it, the redemptive revelatory work of God is carried out. So God elects a family. He chooses a family. We, we said it was implied in God calling Abraham in Genesis 12, one to three, maybe you'd say it's a, it's implied, it's not there. I want to hear, I want to see the word. We will see the word tonight, okay? We will see the word tonight. That that election, God choosing is explicit in Genesis. And we saw that it's apart from anything Abraham's done. He just, he just picks, he picks Abraham. There's nothing that Abraham has done. Whereas some people would make the argument that Noah had this, was righteous. And so that's why God chose him. With Abraham, there's nothing. There's no reference to Abraham being holy, to being faithful, although we'll see later that it's God's work within him, but there's nothing preceding that would, would give a reason as to why God would choose Abraham. The election of Abraham and further development of things of Israel was meant as a, partic a particularistic means towards a universalistic end. So it's a particular means to a universal universalistic ends. That's a hard word. Universalistic end. Okay, so it was particular one man, one family that had that that was to bless all the nations of the earth. We saw that last week. So this is the principle of election. We're going to see this principle of election through history. He chooses a nation. He chooses he chooses Jacob over Esau. He chooses the of uh, he chooses the tribe of Judah to bring about his chosen king, David. So there's, he chooses prophets. Uh, quite, not ironically, but redemptively, he chooses us. We are chosen in Christ. And so this is a principle. So we have those four principles in, in, uh, that he brings out. So in Revelation, the four principles, maybe this is part of the midterm that we'll talk about later. Um, for those of you at CGST, but um, four principles of Genesis, right? Life, probation, testing or temptation, death. Now we have new principles, the principle of election. In the fullness of time, Canaan is a strategic position of supreme importance for the spreading abroad of the gospel to the whole earth. So we can see that the gospel spreads out. It's in the center of the earth to be spread out. So Voss will talk about Revelation being like a tree. Did, does everyone remember this from the reading? I hope you remember this. The, the revelation to the patriarchs is quite wide. They're, they're, they're talking to different kings in the land, right? They're, 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 they're making allegiances with the Bimelech. They're, they're having relationships. There, there, there isn't really specificity to the revelation that's given so far, right? In the Old Testament, though, it becomes very narrow, right? It's, 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 it's very specific. It's very precise. And it's focused upon the nation of Israel, right? So it's the trunk. 
it's the trunk of the tree. So, so the trunk of the tree here is right there. That's focusing on Revelation in the Old Testament. Then you have Revelation in the New Testament. And Revelation in the New Testament is this whole... The, it's it's wide it's broad again right it's 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 broad now in reality in reality there was a place in which the nations were to be brought in by israel so there were so so this this was always the goal this was always the goal okay it was never meant to be just here this was never just it was never meant to be like that Okay, I hope everyone's tracking there with me. Okay, next. Um, election. Election is placed in the foreground. It is not racial or transitory, but individual and permanent. So it's not racial, it's not transitory. It's individualistic and it's permanent. Election is the principle of entering specifically into application of redemption. So in order for you to receive, in order for redemption to be applied, election has to precede that. That's the case with Abraham. That's the case with Jacob. That's the case with Isaac. That's the case will be with Israel. And that's the case that will be with us. Our election is, our election precedes our redemption, right? So we're chosen before the foundations of the earth in Christ before redemption is carried out. So election must precede the application of redemption. We'll, we'll see that in, in, some, in, in some text in a bit. So let's go ahead and let's look. We're looking now specifically at Romans 9. It's actually 9, 1 to 16. Concerning how the scriptures understand the election of Jacob and Esau. Okay, so this is, we're going here because Voss goes here. And this is the clearest. We could, we could um, it's not as clear in in uh, Genesis, so we were, we're really interpreting scripture with scripture, and we're going to the clearest. Okay, so let's Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 16. Okay, so I want you to follow along. I'm going to read. I'm going to read, and I want, I want, to, I want you to follow along here. The word of the Lord. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears witness to me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race according to the flesh is the Christ, who is God forevermore, blessed forever. Amen. So, <laughs> So they're the clearest example that Christ is, in fact, God himself. Paul is dealing with this issue where the Jews have not really accepted the Christ, although they have all of these things. And so the question is, the word of the Lord has failed because Christ's very people are not accepting Christ, right? And so what Paul says is, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. So we see here, the word of God has failed. No, it is not as though the word of God has failed. Why? Explanation here. So this is the explanation. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So this is the description here. Why has God's word not failed? Because not all, of, not all those that come from Israel belong to Israel. So not all those who are physical Israel are in fact Israel. Look at the further clarification here. And not all the children of Abraham, not all are the children of Abraham because they are his offspring. So not all, look here, not all. Verb are who? Children of Abraham. Why? Reason. Because they are his offspring. And this here is physical, okay? So from our, from our study in 
from our study in Genesis, who was a physical offspring of Abraham, but not part of the promise? Who? Ishmael. Ishmael. So Ishmael Ishmael is part of the all. He's part of the children of Abraham. <coughs> but not. So look here. Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So Abraham's offspring goes through Isaac, not Ishmael. Everyone tracking there with me? So why has God's word not failed? Well, one example is that God's promise was not through Ishmael. It was through Isaac. Look at what the meaning here is. Meaning, meaning. This means, this means, this means, this is the verb. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise. The children of the flesh are not the children of God. Who was a, chil who was a child of the flesh? Ishmael. Bibah? It was, and when, when he's saying the flesh, they're both flesh, right? They're both flesh. This is referring to uh, human Submission. effort. Yeah. This is, this is the effort of the flesh. <laughs> Abraham's solution to the flesh, okay? But it's the children of the promise. But the children of the promise are counted as offspring. So the children of the promise, right? And so what's the promise? The promise said about this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a son. So this is referring to Isaac, correct? So in God's election, Abraham wanted Ishmael to be a part, right? He tried and, and God said, no, my election is Isaac, not Ishmael. Now that is a hard statement. Does everyone see? That's a hard statement to accept. Abraham wanted Ishmael. God said no. So this is, this, is, this is the truth about election, and this is hard to accept sometimes. But this is the reality. Ishmael was not chosen to be part of the promise. Verse 10. And not only so, but when Rebekah had conceived children by one man... So this is, again, conceived by one man, right? Now look at this. Is it because Esau was a profane man, right? Hebrew says that. Esau was a profane man. He despised his birthright. He was not faithful. But look here. Look. Though they were not yet born and had done... Nothing either good or bad. So this is this is before works. This is hard. Before they, they had done good or bad, look at this here. What? In order that God's purpose of election might continue. Clarification. God said to Abraham, go. Him who calls, him who speaks, him who chooses. It's not, it's not based on Abraham's choice. It's not based on Isaac's choice. It's based upon him who calls. This is, what it, this is what is hard for us to receive, that God's election is based upon, look at this, his purpose. God's purpose, not because of us. 
She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have, I have hated. So again, this is very difficult for us to accept. Now people will say this is only concerning, this is, some people will say this only concerns um, service but not salvation, okay? So they'll say, this is only dealing with service, but the focus is not on salvation, okay? That's what they'll say. That's one possible answer. And some people will take that. Um, my question would be, well, what does the text say? So immediately Paul's question is, what shall we say then? So this is the question here. Is there injustice on God's part? So if the question is, is there injustice? Oh boy, injustice. Inju injustice is not concerning service. Injustice is concerning salvation, Diba. This word injustice. Correct? Is, is God unjust? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So I'm going to bring several other theological truths in here. The presupposition that we go into this is that all of us are good, and so we all must receive God's grace. But the reality is, is that it's not like I'm going to have, I'm going to, lift up someone who is good. I'm going to exalt someone who is good. Look at what the text is saying. I will have mercy. I will have compassion. What is presupposed here and true is that all humanity are sinners condemned unworthy of God's mercy. See, we, we immediately look at this and say, this is unjust. This is unjust. Because we deserve, you know, how can how can Esau? No, the reality is that all of us, all of us are all of us are all of us are sinners, all of us are condemned. And it's amazing that God will show mercy on anyone. Do you see how that's a completely in, in one category? God owes us. God owes every person to be saved. But that's not what's being described. God does not owe us anything. That's, that is something very hard to accept, but Paul will highlight that in Romans eleven thirty six. Who has ever given God a gift to be repaid? The, God owes utang to no one. Okay? And this is hard. This is very hard, but this is the case. And so this is why this principle of election is going to continue to come back. Does that mean that we are not to call to preach the gospel to everyone? No, we preach the gospel to everyone. Does that mean that that someone cannot repent or, or be, believe. No, we preach, be, repent and believe to anyone. And anyone who repents and believes will be saved. But when we look back at the work behind the scenes, we don't say it's from his own effort. This is the work of God in his life. This is the principle of election. And we see it being played out in the patriarchs. So look at this. It depends upon... Human will or exertion, no, but God, who, who has mercy. We've forgotten, how, we have forgotten this truth. The fundamental, the first, maybe the second, the second revelation of the truth of mankind is that man is wicked from his youth, right? We, we emphasize that in, in, in the, the story of Noah up until the judgment. Everything in man, from, from his heart, from his heart, from his mind, from his actions, it was only evil continually. 
after when God gives common grace, he says that he says that it's only, you know, man is wicked. But, uh, I will never again curse, uh, curse uh, creation because man is wicked from his youth. Okay. And so fundamentally, this is a very, very, uh, what they call this, as you said, very hard to accept. Yeah. <laughs> we are all sinners condemned and worthy of God's mercy. Yeah. Yeah. And we are all sinners, as you always say, from birth, from beginning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there a time that uh, this this thing of being unworthy started? Because somehow. We are God's creation. We, we always look at, at us yeah. as God's creation. And we always describe the, the, the adjective as everything he created was good. Yeah. And then suddenly be, we become unworthy because yeah. somebody disobeyed. So yeah. that what happened, what happened then to the good creation of God? That's a very hard question, I, I, I suppose. Yeah. No, it's a very hard question, Kuyo Boy. What, 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 we, what the scripture is clear on, Romans 5 will say this, just the preceding context, that in Adam all sinned. In Adam all sinned. And then from Adam, when we are in Adam, we both are in Adam in the sense that, that he represented us. So just as Christ represents us and makes us righteous, Adam represented us and we all fell, number one. Number two, we are like Adam in that we all sin. And so the, God's creation in common grace sense is still good, but it's fallen, it's corrupt, it's marred because of the sin of man. And so maybe that doesn't really answer your question, but it kind of gets at, it gets at the, the answer to your question. And, and maybe this draws, this further highlights why God so God just allowed man to be who he was after the fall and, and the world descended into pure anarchy and, and great wickedness. So maybe, maybe it doesn't answer the why, but it answers the what, that this is the reality of who we are as sinners. And any one of us looks in our heart and we just see a lot of sin. Anyone who says, even, even with the spirit, that, you know, oh, I'm a good person now. I'm not, I'm not a sinner. You know, I don't know what you're looking at because I look at my own life and I still see a whole lot of sin. We all see a whole lot of sin, but it, but maybe it's a more reflective question, perhaps. Boy? It's, question. it's very hard. It's very hard. Really. Yeah, it's very hard. It's very hard. Yeah, it's very hard. Tama. Question. Uh, Ray, go ahead. So what's the point then of being good when at the end of the day, <laughs> It's still God's choice to save you or not. Like in many cases in the life of Jacob, he was very, he's a schemer, he's a liar and everything. Yeah. At the end of the day, yeah. God still chooses him. Yeah, so so it's still God having mercy, Diba. Right? So it's still it's still God having mercy on him. So when we look back, when we look back at the work of God, number one, this is what the scripture says. So again, you know, perhaps we're wrestling with this, but we can't say because we don't like the answer or we don't like what the text says, we just will ignore it. The, the, the first step is to acknowledge this is what the text, this is how it's presented. And then, and then we seek to study how we can reconcile or how we can work through other things. So, so this is in connection with the, the first revelation that man is wicked. So all of us we have to come to that place that we're, that we're wicked, we're undeserving. No one of his own, Paul says that, right? No one seeks after God. We all seek our own way. Okay, so that's that's the condition of, of mankind. We all seek our own way. So then when you're asking, what's the point of being good? Are you saying, are you saying um, preaching being good? Or, or, or maybe you can clarify, like, in what context are you saying, what's the point of being good? As as a Christian, as an unbeliever, as as one sharing sharing the gospel, um, like I mean, like when people do bad things, still God choose if they are chosen to be part of God's family, part yeah. to be saved. Then, as compared to people being 
uh, doing good works, hoping to get favor from God. I mean, yeah. Uh, where's the just? Where's the? Where's justice in all those yeah. things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what we can say definitively, so, uh, so, so Hebrews chapter eleven says definitively, with definitively, without faith we cannot please God. Deba, it says that without faith we cannot please God. So, my first response would be someone, someone who is trying to gain God's favor without faith. The motive is what matters, right? Not the outward, the motive. Their heart is corrupt because at the end of the day, Dibad, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord they got with all their heart, mind, soul. There isn't this love of God, right, Diba? It's it's for their self-preservation. It's still selfishly motivated. So I would I would strongly push back on the notion that some people are are genuinely desiring to do what's good. Uh, most of the time we do what's good because it benefits us. So, and actually that's the reality with all mankind. There, you're, you're, no, one, no one without the work of the spirit is genuinely loving God selflessly, depending upon God selflessly, Ray. W would you agree with that? Yeah, I understand. I, I, yeah. I know that theology, but I mean, just a uh, thought lang ba? Kasi given yeah, yeah, yeah. By, by comparison, people have tried to do good things and people who do bad things yet because of just because of the reason that God chooses yeah. whom yeah. He want, yeah, and they get saved. So if, if He chooses yeah. the the badder, the bad guy, how how is that even be yeah. more merciful to the person trying to do good? I have so, I have an so, answer. I have I have an answer to raise question. Okay, go ahead. Go, go ahead, uh, Kuya Boy. The, uh, the the context of race definition of good is from the human point of view, not from yeah. God's point of view, because. If we use human definition for good, then many of us are good in that sense. Yeah, tam, but tam. if we use God's standard of good, no one of us is good. Yeah. Yeah, none of tam. us. That's why yeah. we are we are we are on that category because none of us yeah. is good in God's yeah. sight. Yeah, we have boy understandably, but on the thought of it, bana, why would God choose the evil person over somebody who tries to do good? Although in the context of God's view. It's really people are all bad, but if you take effort to do something good, even though it's it's on your personal, by comparison, talaga, it's better to have the person who tries to do good works as compared to, to people who does good bad bad things, talaga, di ba? Yeah. But I know that's, that's yeah. yeah. That's so, the problem. That's the problem with that with that definition, Ray, because we do not know who is evil, who is good from our end, but only God knows who is evil, who is good, who is bad. From, no, like That's in, why, like from our point case. of view, we can see a person as good, as not evil, but in God's, but in no, some respect, he is evil. That's that's like the problem. Example, in the case of uh, the mother of Jacob, or Isaac, was that Isaac who, who really, who, who skimmed their way just to get the blessing. That's evil in what, in that, in some sense, because it's an injustice on the part of the, of, of Esau, although Esau was Conceived to be a perceived to be a person who is uh, what you call this uh, profane, but even the actions of uh, his brother and his mother was was not is even more than what you call this category of being uh, a person who is evil as well. So 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 right. Let's kind of parse your questions because I really understand what you're saying. I understand. We are coming from, and I, and I want us to rethink our, I, I, I'm, I'm really piggybacking what, what Koyo Bobo said. I want us to rethink that. I want us to rethink our definition of good and evil. That's what I'm trying to get at here. Okay. So, so Ray, let me ask you a question. Um, what's more fundamental, what we think or what we do in, 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 God, in, in God's law, in God's law, what, what's more fundamental? The, the intent. Yes, the, 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 even even in law, but for, right, the, the intent has to be there, right? So more fundamental is is internal. The, the the we could say desire, right? And so 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 here we have maybe maybe we have good works out here. Diba, maybe you have maybe you have um, church attendance. Diba, church attendance. Maybe you have um, morality here. 
a, a form, right? Here you have, here you have, um, you have maybe there's uh, sex, maybe there's drunkenness. Maybe there's, maybe there's here, there's, um, right, there's, there's covetousness. Uh, th that's internal. Let me, let me just do here. Let me just, let's just put here materialism, materialism, right? So all, all that we can see is this external, right? So we would say, this is good, this is bad, okay? But if we're looking at the internal, Ray, Diba here, the, he's coming from his desire for pleasure, Diba. He's coming from desire for pleasure. But here, what is the desire here? If this is not for God, but for self, this is still idolatry. And this is still, this is still black, just like this is black. This is black. This is also black. And so you, we can't assess these outward good works unless we know what the internal is. So if the only thing that is good is a pursuit of God, but if he's looking at self, that's fundamentally what Adam and Eve did. If they're doing good works for self-preservation or for self-pleasure, I want to have a high position in the kingdom of God. So I'm going to do all these good works. That's just as internally corrupt as someone that's seeking pleasure now. They're just seeking pleasure later. Diba, this is pleasure now. This is pleasure later. In, but the issue, yeah, go ahead. But in the case of the patriarchs, don't you think they have the same internal desire that to be acknowledged as somebody? In the, in, in the future because at the end of the day if you look at the, if you look back at the, their life they, yes. they're looking forward to that kind of uh, promise by God so it's still internally a desiring for their self uh, glorification yes. at the end of the day while it is true that it's because they believe that it became a, a form of faith from their end yeah but at the end of the day you could also say that it's both internally uh, what they call this self um, what they call this glorification yeah, because yeah. then they're being given the promise that they will be glorified and they will have many descendants and they will yeah, become yeah, yeah. wealthy or something yeah so, so, so could, yeah. at any point the, the, their faith may have been they may have they have faith but they also have their own evil desires in the, at, at the yeah. at, in, from their end Okay, so so th this so so we all we all have been here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna push back a little bit on Ray, and I don't want anyone to say like, oh, you know, we, we've all been here. We've all had these. I've had this interpretation as well before, Ray. So so I am gonna push back on 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 your on on your comments. But the reason for do me doing this is I want us to see this is why the biblical theological framework is is absolutely foundational to our interpretation. So, so you've, you've made some exegetical conclusions from the appearance in Genesis. That's what you said. You know, they had the self-motivation. You see the sin. And, and if you just had exegetically examined Genesis without further revelation, I, I could agree with your conclusions. The problem is, is that later revelation, everything's connected. So History of Revelation is, is intercept, uh, indistinguishable from history of redemption. And, and the history of redemption is brought climactically, climactically to us in the New Testament. So the question we have to ask is, how does the New Testament understand, how has God revealed to us the heart in the New Testament of the patriarchs? Okay, and so the benefit of looking at both Genesis and the New Testament is that, number one, the patriarchs are not perfect. They are sinful, okay? So any one of us that's saying in the church, myself, you, anyone else, anyone else who's saying we're, we're really good, we're, we're righteous, we're holy, in, in, in a true sinless sense, that's completely wrong. So, so all of us have sin, okay? So we see the sin in the patriarchs. Some of our sins are pretty bad, right? If, if, we, if, if God put before us our sins, we'd be really embarrassed by our sins, okay? So in many ways, we've been put before the, the, the sins of the patriarchs, and it's somewhat embarrassing. But, but we don't have their heart. 
we do have their heart in the sense that they are believing in the promises of God. They do some great things. Abraham leaving his own land, his family, his kindred, and going to another land, that takes incredible, insane amount of faith, okay? So that would be one example that we do have these behind the scenes, like, wow, that's, that takes an amazing faith. Uh, you know, whereas Cain is just spitting in God's face, doesn't care, Lamech doesn't care, you know, he's proud for his murder. Abraham's trusting, and he's trusting in this, in this belief apart from righteousness. What I want to do now is let's go to, I want, I'm going to go to one text in, in Romans, and then we'll just touch on another text in Hebrew. So let's go in our Bibles to Romans 4, because this gets at what, 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 um, what, because Abraham does some crazy sins. He says his, his wife is his sister. He lies to a, to a, to a, he doesn't have faith, right? He, he lies to a foreign king. He has sex with his, with his servant, right? So, so Abraham is, is a sinner. But it, what does the revelation, what, what does God reveal to us that was in Abraham's heart, even in, in the midst of his moments of great sin? Okay, let's look here. Look at this. Uh, um, I'm kind of jumping ahead because of Ray's question. I'm jumping ahead to, to, this, to this principle of faith. But because of Ray's question, I just feel it's really appropriate for us to examine it now. Romans 4.16. This is why it depends on faith. Okay? So uh, this is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace. So this is the purpose here. So we're going to get into... Is, is Abraham doing this for self, for self, or is he doing it with a focus on God? Is he doing it with a desire to glorify God with, with all that he is, right? What's the motivation behind the scenes? Maybe Romans is going to give us this revelation. Um, it was guaranteed to all of his offspring, and it's not only the adherents of the law, but those that share faith. So the one who shares faith with Abraham is the Gentiles. So this would be Gentiles. This would be Jews. Okay? As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations uh, of, in the presence of God in whom he believes. So here, here we go. In whom he believes. So this is the belief of Abraham. And who does he believe? He believes in the one who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. So this is the work of, uh, this, is, this is creator. Creator God. That's who he believes in. Now look at this. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. So. Number one, his faith was not weakened, but, uh, um, uh, but, but becoming strong, right? He did not weaken in faith. So this is not a superficial faith. This is an incredible faith. This is uh, in spite of these odds, which is as good as dead, okay? Or he considered the barrenness of of. of Sarah's womb. So in spite of these things, right, he does not weaken in faith. Okay? No unbelief made him waver. <laughs> this is the revelation. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. Watch. But he grew strong in his faith for self-purpose as he gave glory to God. So this is a faith that, of course, he's receiving, the, he's receiving these incredible promises. But his focus is not on himself. Dibak came. He only cares about himself. Lamet only cares about himself. Leaves the premise of, promise of God. Leaves the, pre, uh, leaves the presence of God. Doesn't care. Abraham is focused upon giving glory to God in his faith. So this is, this is in his heart. He's a, he's a fallen man. He commits, he commits sin. Uh, in his heart, 
there's repentance. In his heart, there's saving faith. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words counted to him was not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. Look at this. It is counted to us who believe in him who raised Jesus Christ from the Lord, uh, our Lord, who delivered him up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Now, this is the thing, Ray. This is the thing, and this is all of us to catch. If we are believing for our own selfish motivation just to escape hell, and we have no desire to, to give glory to God, to love God, to see God as our possession, if we're only having faith to escape hell and to receive the benefits of heaven, we don't have saving faith. We are not genuine believers. A saving faith is fundamentally focused upon God. We were created, Westminster Confession, to, to man, for a first statement, we, we are created to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. If we are, if we, if we have chosen, uh, if we, if we are in faith for our own selfish motivation, if it's only for us, if it's only for what God can give us, maybe we don't have saving faith. But in Abraham, we see the example of faith that we are called to do. Now, this is the most amazing thing, Ray. Right? If all we had was Abraham as this perfect example we would all despair because we all have sin. You would despair, Ray. I would despair. If we only had all of the good in Abraham, if it was presented as this perfect person, we would despair. Abraham's faults and his strengths are, are given to us. And Paul said, it doesn't matter. So God's election does not depend on our goodness. It depends on his work. And we are called to have faith in him. And so, um, this is another principle that the, the principle of persevering faith that is revealed to us in that's revealed to us in um, in uh, in Genesis. So Abraham has in, uh, has incredible failure, right? Has sex, has adultery. By God's definition, has adultery with his mistress, right? No doubt he and Sarah, I mean, Sarah condoned it. Sarah condoned it. She's like, go to my woman, go to commit adultery, right? Abraham has incredible faith in offering up his son, Isaac, on the mountain. We're going to see that later tonight. Insane faith. I don't know if, I don't know if I could lay my daughter out and give her up and kill her before God. I don't know, you know, I'm kind of getting, to, I don't know if I could do it. By faith, I believe that I could. That takes insane faith to lay Isaac on the altar and be prepared to kill his daughter, his son. Abraham loved and believed in God more than even the value of a, of a child. Insane faith. So what I really want us to see, number one, is that in Genesis, we have incredible moments of incredible belief and faith by the patriarchs. We have a lot of sin. We have a lot of sin. But what was revealed to us in the New Testament is that, in fact, the patriarchs had this saving, growing, glorifying God kind of faith, whereas Lamech, Cain, Esau did not. And ultimately, that's due to God's election, God's work in their lives, apart from their effort. That is a hard pill to swallow, but our first step is to accepting the truth of God's revelation. That's the first step. And so, no doubt, we're all struggling with that. No doubt, we're having maybe an aha moment. Maybe it's, it's hard for us. If, if you said it's not hard for you, then you haven't experienced these texts yet. I, I experienced these texts. Um, but, this is, but this is God's word to us. And so uh, I've kind of jumped the gun in looking at, at, at Romans 4. 
But in fact, Abraham has this. So coming back to this picture here. In fact, internally, Abraham has genuine faith. And a self-righteous person, this will be full of pride, self-preservation, self-autonomy. I can do this. There's a lot of terrible sins in, 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 in a good person that is not living by faith. Trust me, when you get close to them, you will see a whole bunch of sins. You will see a whole bunch of idols in their heart. And when you step on those idols, they will lash out with, with, with the wrath of, of the kingdom of darkness. Um, and so Jonathan Edwards talks about every one of us has different pleasures and different desires. And so it just depends on what your desires are. But if it's not led by saving faith, um, the good person and the bad, it's the same. And, that's, and that's, what, that's what Romans 3, 10 to 20 tells us. There are no, none good. No one seeks God. We've all, we've all gone our own way. We've all corrupted ourselves. Um, and, 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 it, and it also comes back to this idea of if we just examine the external. Yeah, if we just ex examine the external, it doesn't seem fair. But when we look at the heart, it's, it's corrupt. The Pharisees were the most righteous people outside. I think that if we saw the Pharisees externally, you would be like, wow. But in their heart, the word of God, Jesus says they're, they're, they're empty tombs, they're sepulchers, they're dead, they're dead bones inside them. So um, I, I want every one of us to be thinking about this. This is not something that we're going to, 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 to decide overnight. It's something that you have to wrestle with. But I want us to see that, 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 that God chose Abraham apart from Abraham. God chose, the, the text here says this. God, this is what the word of God says. We have to wrestle with it. Before they had done good or evil, that God's purpose of election might continue, God chose I, uh, uh, Jacob. So it's 7:47. Let's take a let's take a 10 minute break, get some water. Um, uh, let's let's take a 10 minute break and let's come back and we're going to try to finish the. We have some other texts we're going to look at. Um, a parallel passage for those who want to study further. Hebrews 11. So Hebrews 11 actually goes through. It goes through all of Genesis and even the Old Testament. In fact, Abel has faith. In fact, Noah had faith. In fact, Isaac, Jacob, and, and Abraham had faith. Um, but everyone who does, the, this is what we talked about before. Everyone who is doing good works in the Old Testament, they're genuine good works. We need to presuppose saving faith in doing those works because that's what the New Testament reveals to us. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So, we, so th this is the benefit. When we have the biblical theological framework, okay? Revelation and redemption intertwine, inseparable. Climax in New Testament, in Christ, in the teaching of Christ and his apostles. We can look at everything here. We can interpret everything here, and it makes sense. When we don't have, the, when we don't have this framework, when we don't have this understanding that revelation and redemption are intertwined, when we don't see the climax, as the, the, the final revelation coming in Christ, the Old Testament, we can have a lot of bad interpretations. Um, and we're all guilty. We all have had bad interpretations. I've had terrible interpretations, okay? Some of the interpretations, I, I'm embarrassed, okay? So anybody who's saying like, no, nah, you know, let's get this dog pile away. You don't understand you don't understand your own previous poor interpretations. All of us have left church and be like, man, I this is this is terrible. You know, I messed up that text. Okay. So so no one should be pointing fingers. And if anyone points fingers, let me know. I'll, I'll give them a hard time. All of us fall short. And, and I want all of us to see. All of us are guilty. <laughs> all of us stand condemned. I want us to see this. 
I want you to see the biblical theological framework, and I want, I want you to see that in the New Testament, it's further revealing and clarifying what is already there in principial form. We're looking at the principle of election. We're looking at the principle of faith. We're looking at the principle of life. It's there, but it's further expounded upon in the New Testament. So with that, let's take a 10-minute break. I need to get a drink. Let's come back at 8, and let's get back at it, okay? Let's take, it, let's take a 10-minute break. It will be observed that Paul here adds an explanation of the end, which this disclosure, uh, disclosure of this purpose served in the plan of God. The phrase, the elective purpose of God, is explained in the following words, not of works, but of him that calleth. This is equivalent to not of works, but grace. The idea calling being with Paul an, expono, exp, an exponent of divine monergism. Monergism just means that God is doing the work himself. It's not synergistic. He's not working with man to save. So Abraham, the promise, right? We talked about this. Abraham could do nothing to bring about the promise. He just had to, he had faith and God did the work. In our salvation, we can do nothing. We, 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 we exercise faith, we trust, we submit, and we wait for God to act. So this is what Voss means by divine monergism. Revelation of the doctrine of election therefore serves the revelation of the doctrine of grace. So, so election is in the context of divine grace. God's call, God calls attention to his sovereign discrimination between man and man to place the proper emphasis upon the truth that his grace alone is the source of all spiritual good to be found in man. This is really, this comes down right here. This comes down, if you could, um, God calls attention to his sovereign discrimination between man and man. It's not, this is actually kind of getting to the point of, of some of what Ray was saying, that it's not because of man, it's because of God. Now that might be really hard for us to accept, but God, uh, God is sovereign. God is in control. It's God's plan, not ours. His grace alone is the source of all spiritual good to be found in man. And we know this is the case because of, remember, we have to go back to the time of Noah. Diba? The time of Noah, the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and that every intent of his thought was only evil continually. That is true for all of mankind. And so when man is good, when man does good things in a true sense, it's because of God's grace inside him that is doing it, that's found in him. It's God's creative work working inside him. So this is, and this is the, the in the life of Abraham, in the life of Jacob, in the life of Isaac, this is the foundation for us. It's, it's, it's where we see it for the first time, clearly laid out. We, we see echoes of it in Noah's life, the echoes of it in Abel's life, in Seth's life, but explicitly is the foundation and then it's brought to climax in the New Testament. Next, so number two. So we got one. I don't even know how we're going to do this. We're, number one was the, the, the election. Number two, the objectivity of the gifts given. So this, this, should, this should go quickly here. But um, the objective action of God was for the patriarchs interla interlinked with three great promises. So these are real objective gifts that there would be a great nation that the land of Canaan would be their possession, that they would become a blessing for all people. This has to be objective. You want to know why? Because if this is not objective, God's promise to give us eternal life, that the, that the, we will, the meek will inherit the earth, that we will inherit the earth, that we will be a part of, we will be kingdom of priests to our God, that's meaningless if this is not real. So our promises, the promises that God gave to us it's because uh, um, his promises are objective here. This is, these are tokens. These are physical tokens to the greater promises that are given to us. Okay? So this is so important. And this is revealed to us objectively. And we see it objectively. We see it real. And this gives us assurance of, of, of our own, the, own the, our, the promises that God gave to us as well. More on this, this topic. We have here, so this is what I'm getting at. We have here the beginning of factual religion, a religion attaching itself to objective 
divine interpositions on behalf of man. So this is not myth. This is the beginning of real religion, and it's our foundation. Abraham is the father of us all. We are, by faith, children of Abraham. Galatians 3. So you could put here Galatians 3. You can look at Romans 4. Um, Galatians 2, 3, and 4. Um, we, are, we are offspring of Abraham like Isaac. Galatians 4. By faith. He does not begin with the patriarchs as simply needing reform. So they were not good. <laughs> so, so this is the truth. This is where he's showing mercy on whom he will show mercy. He's showing compassion on whom he will show compassion. The patriarchs were not good. And Ray is correct. They weren't good. Uh, other, other mankind wasn't good. We, we all fall short. We, we all stand condemned. But it's God's work in election that brings about faith. And, and then, of course, we have to exercise faith. And, and, and then it's the promises being realized. So um, uh, the keynote is not what Abraham has to do for God. <laughs> it's not what Abraham has to do for God, but what God will do for Abraham. Uh, I was just watching a video. I might share it. Uh, I don't agree with a lot of what the Bible Project says, but they have some good content. And in the Bible Project, they say like, Babel, they tried to make their name great, and God put a kibosh on it. And then Abraham pops on the scene, and God says, I'll make your name great. So, so the people in Babel tried to make their name great. God kiboshes it, destroys it. Then he just grabs the man and says, I'm going to make your name great. God is sovereign. He is the king. He's the big dog. We have to submit to that. Then in response to this, the subjective fr frame of mind that changes the inward and outward life is cultivated. So we are responding to the grace of God. We are responding to the grace of God. This comes back to our discussions in leadership class. Kuya Henry, Kuya Bullboy. God-centered, <laughs> God-centered theology. It's a God-centered theology here. Closely connected with this feature is another, the historic progressive character of religion of revelation in it the all important thing is that god has acted in the past here we go has acted in the past is acting in the present and promises to act in the future so this is this is the biblical theological framework the past the present assures us of the future we are in the present we see him act in the past we have assurance of the future the patriarchs saw him act in the present in the past and then in the future so the, that's why it's so important. The objectivity of the gifts are so important. Biblical, re, so this is where we're going at. Past, present, future. Biblical religion is thoroughly eschatological in its outlook. It's redemptive. <laughs> God wants to dwell in the fullest sense with man. We want to dwell with God in the fullest sense. If you have any other purpose than to dwell in the presence of God, to see and savor God, his son, his spirit, then I really want you to question and, and to look into your heart because our focus is to be in the presence of God. And this is the truth. I've said this before. It's not original to me. If heaven did not have God, I would not want to be there. If heaven did not have God, I would not want to be there. I want to be where God and his son are. That is, that is, that is hard. I would rather be suffering in the presence of God with Jesus than in heaven with all the pleasures of the world without God. And with that being said, we still have the flesh. We still are tempted to have that perspective. Promises are fulfilled supernaturally. <laughs> so they are supernatural. The promises, Voss say, says, are fulfilled supernaturally. God does not need Abraham. He will not entertain Abraham's ideas. Right? Abraham says, I have, I have, I have an heir. Uh, I, have, I have a servant. No. I have Ishmael. No. It will be a son. I told you it will be a son. You will have a son from your very own loins. We have, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oops. Right, is, yeah, Since go ahead, you mentioned ahead. that, since you mentioned that already, 
I, I was thinking that at at some did Abraham at some point have been had been faithless to God because given the scenario that he was really trying to make his own way and did not believe God at some point of the promise. So I would say that that the, the, remember it's we look we can read Abraham's life in two hours, Diva. But that yeah. that that encompass that com encompass like forty years of Abraham's life or fifty years something like that. So so no doubt in my life, Ray, I will tell you there are times where I question my faith. I have made some very bad decisions because I doubted. So all of us, including Abraham, we have acted faithlessly because God does not demand a perfect faith. He he demands a persevering faith a faith that endures. And so you're right. I, there was moments of doubt, but there's difference, Ray, there's difference in moments of doubt than in someone who is a doubter. Diva, there is someone who, there's, there's a difference between someone who is struggling in faith and someone who is a skeptic. There's a fundamental difference. Um, and so again, we have to look at Abraham as a man that's beset with sin, but the work of the spirit is evident in his life. And if we only had Abraham as this man of faith that had no sin, we would all despair because that does not describe any of our lives. And in many ways, I am so thankful that the, the errors and sins were included because we, we recognize that we are but dust. We are, we are frail, fallen creatures just clinging to Christ for life. Great, great, great question though, Ray. And it's something that we all I think we'll always wrestle with that. I think we'll always have those moments of wrestling with that and, and really coming, um, dealing with, you know, because sometimes it's really like the sin is crazy. And it's like, well, I don't have that kind of sin. That's the flesh coming up in us, right? Yeah. And the way I see it, Tim, is that at the very instance, you really put your faith genuinely in Christ or in God. That's the time that reckons that you have faith, even though you yes. fail in the next time around. Yes, exactly. So it's that it's that moment. Yeah, yeah. That's it's, the way I understand. Yeah, it's, the the moment we have faith, we are declared righteous. The moment we have faith, we are brought from from death to life. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. So you're right. It's that moment we have genuine saving faith. We cling. To Christ in faith, we are justified, and then it's a life. It's a life of struggle. <laughs> it's a spiritual warfare. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The the flesh raging against the spirit. Okay, let let's go on here, just because I want to. I want to. Um, we need to move on here. So next, next. So next, we have. Oops, we missed one. Sorry. Hold on here. Number four, the subjective transformation of life. So we talked about this a little bit, right? That, the, that the, the patriarchs were not perfect. They weren't in need of reform. They needed transformation, okay? And so what Ray's getting at is it's true. They were, there, was, there was sin in their life. There was a lot of sin. Jacob is a schemer. Um, and at the same time, the spirit works and transforms his life. And he becomes a man of faith. Although maybe Jacob's harder to find than others, but it's there nonetheless. Uh, the characters of the three patriarchs, that of Jacob is least <laughs> represented as an ideal one. So they are not ideal. This is also historicity, because if they were ideal, there'd be no sin, Diba. But they're not. They're fallen. It's, re it's reprehensible features are rather strongly brought out. Ray is really highlighting that. This is done in order to show that di divine grace is not the reward for, but the source of noble traits. So that's what I've been trying to emphasize. Divine grace is the source not the reward. I hope everyone really picks up on that. It's the, it's the source, not the reward. Grace, and so Kea mentioned this last week, I think. Grace overcoming human sin and transfer, transforming human nature is the keynote of revelation here. Overcoming grace transforms the human heart, the human nature, and it's a keynote of Revelation here. And we just see that throughout, throughout Revelation and Redemption. 
We must consider that Jacob did exercise faith in the promises of God. He acted strongly to be a partaker in the Abrahamic covenant, whereas Esau does not, even, in his, even if his acts at times were flawed and sinful. So here's the thing. Esau despises his birthright. And what despise means literally is to think little. Esau did not believe in the promises of God, whereas Jacob highly valued them, so much so he sins, right? So, so, so we're, we're dealing with heart issues that need to be transformed. At the same time, there is this belief uh, in the, the, the Abrahamic covenant, the promise that God had made, okay? So, of course, there was, there was corrupt yeah, motivation there. Yeah. Free, right? yeah. what, what was that? He acted covetously because he committed yeah. that uh, promise. No, absolutely. And so you see that you see that you see the sin and in the, in the desire for sure, absolutely. But but towards the end, this this gets at the the the, the wrestling with God that he is. I would say, and and Voss brings this out, Ray, is that by that point in the wrestling of God, there there is genuine faith, there is prayer, this wrestling in prayer, persistent faith, asking God, believing that God can bless and protect. And so you're a hundred percent right, right? Early on, he's a conniver. He's, he's, he's acting in his own fleshly desires, but by, but towards the end, there is this, 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 this saving faith that is present. And, and, um, uh, Hebrews 11 also picks up on that. So, so, Tim, could we also yeah. say then for people who ask good ways, you know, who tries to do good works in their own selfish ways, but God can still work on them if that's what you're oh. saying. Yeah, no, definitely, no, so, right? Yeah. So, so, so what? Yeah, absolutely. So, but the comparison was that one was good and one was bad. And what I was trying to say, and what I think Bobby was trying to say as well, is that they're all really bad. Okay. But that does not mean so God can bring a self righteous. Uh, self-righteous religious person to saving faith. Absolutely. He does that. He saves the self-righteous. He, sa he saves the, the, the wicked drunkard in his grace for his own purpose. Right? So yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and we pray. So we are not partial. We pray for all. We share the gospel with all. But at the end of the day, we cannot convince. It's the spirit and it's God's plan. So once we share once we pray, we have to, we cannot manipulate. So this is where, if we think that we're in control, we try to fabricate, we try to fabricate a response, right? And so that's where it becomes sinful in, in our presentation of the gospel. Uh, Koi Bobo, you want to say something? Uh, in relation to what, to what Ray had been explaining, let's look at the thief at the, at the cross. That was probably their only meeting with Christ, but then and then Christ immediately said, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the most amazing part of, of this kind of grace and this kind of uh, election that God is expressing. You can never tell when, when it will be and who, who will be the yeah. recipient of this from our point of view. Yeah. And, no, that's a phenomenal example, Koyo Boy Boy. And, but you see the genuine repentance. He, you see in his statement, we deserve what we get. Like he, he comes to that realization. He comes to genuine repentance. He's the prodigal son. I don't deserve to be called a son. Just make me, that's genuine repentance and faith right there. No, that's excellent. That's absolutely excellent. That, that, excellent example. Yep. So now we're on to the divine name. So I went through a little bit quick because we still have like five more to go. El Shaddai, El Shaddai. So this is the revelation of one of the names of God, the earliest naming where there actually is used. And so Voss is going to talk about it. Um, definition, to overpower or to destroy. That's the Hebrew. So El stands for God. For, for God. Shaddai is, I believe, a, a verb, a verbal root concerning to overpower or to destroy. And so another translation could be the overpowerer, the destroyer, the powerful one. The LXX or the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew renders it the all-powerful. <laughs> the all-powerful. 
Uh, Panto Krator. Panto is, is all, Krator is power. So all powerful. That's how the LXX uh, interprets it. And we don't have time to go there, but this is applied to Jesus. This is applied to Jesus. I will share, I will share a handout. Let me just get my pen and paper here. I will share a video where we discuss this in another class. I will share this um, on our thing. So what I will do is I will share a video where we discuss Revelation seven to nine on our Facebook group. If you want to watch, if you want to, if you want to more information, because Revelation one, I think it's Re Revelation one seven and eight, not one seven to nine, one seven to eight. A lot of times people will understand verse eight as a reference to to God the Father. In fact, it's a reference to Jesus Christ, and I believe that very strongly. And that we do exegetically break it down. I have a video there, so I will share that in our. You don't have to watch it, but if you want to, it really brings that out because when you just do a simple reading you would think oh this is god the father it's not jesus but when you look at you really get into the text and you look at it it's really it's identifying the the lord almighty in the old testament with jesus christ so um i'll share that video through supernaturalism of his procedure he as it were overpowers nature in the service of his grace and compels her to further his design so this idea of overpowering the god that overpowers he's stronger than nature. He uses nature to bring about his, his purposes. And we see that in Abraham's life. How does he overpower nature? Someone explain to me, how does he overpower nature? When he commanded it, like the rain and the, the storm to stop. But, but Ray, in, in Abraham's life, oh, sorry, how, does Abraham. he, yeah, how does he overpower nature in Abraham's life? Not sure. Dan, Dan, <laughs> Dan, Dan, Dan. Uh, having, do do? having to have a son okay. at 100 years old. <laughs> Think about that. Sarah was barren. We can still not do it. We cannot do it with all the technology. We cannot do it. And God did it. He had it. Yeah. It's crazy. In many you ways, can that's do it. The... you can do it now, Tim, with the advent of the bank, sperm bank. But not old age with the woman. Not old age with the woman. Maybe with the man, but not old age with the woman. It came from Sarah when her womb was already dead. I don't mean to speak disrespectful or anything, but yeah, another overpowering nature is the reigning of sulfur in Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, excellent. Throughout, and then the, the flood waters, Diba, because God is the creator God. So he rains fire from heaven, he floods the earth, he brings life from the dead. He's the one in control. And so it's very appropriate. Genesis. He is, the, he is the overpowerer. He brings nature under his command because he's the creator God. How about that divine voice from heaven? <laughs> I mean, speak of Abraham. <laughs> That's not happy now, you know. Many people yeah, think, it, but it's not really true. <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, it, do, it doesn't. Yeah, you're right. No, there's no, no voice from, I, I want to see that literal. I want to see that voice coming literal. It's, it's already done in the coming of Christ, when he said, this is my beloved son, no more after that. <laughs> Tim? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in reference to this particular <clears throat> point that you've mentioned, I don't, uh, what are your thoughts about Bosch telling that uh, the word L comes from the root word, or rather, uh, means Allah or something? Yeah, so, so, the, again, we have to recognize that Voss is dealing with liberals. He's from a liberal school. And so there's a whole bunch of different liberal interpretations and views of the origin of this word L. And so he's looking at uh, source for where the word comes from, other derivations in other languages. And so he's just expounding upon that because he's interacting with those who would hold the various positions. So in, in that in that sense, you know, looking looking in um, like like Allah, I think he brings up or, or Allah. Yeah, there is because um, 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 Arabic is is related in some way. If you trace back the 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 language lineage, there's a connection with with Hebrew. So we would expect the the word for God to be similar in in other languages. So um, 
Yeah, but but he's more interacting because of his context. You, you know, I don't really spend a lot of time on that just because it's not really beneficial for our context. If we had a lot of Muslims in Takloban, maybe we would be <laughs> looking at that more. So it just yeah, just... my 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 father's line is a Muslim, so it oh, gives wow. me okay. Feel, yeah. Maybe you need to study it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, good question though. That's a good question. That's really good. Okay, let's go on here. Let's go on. Um, uh, so here we go. We've already studied the passage, but this is the first explicit reference to the act of faith. That's we looked at before in, 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 in Genesis 15, 1 to 6. And Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And so that is the first explicit uh, statement of this uh, faith in place of righteousness, that God credits righteousness without works, but by faith. So that is the first reference explicitly to the gospel salvation through faith alone. So whereas many people claim it's very late, many people claim it's only in the New Testament, in fact, it's very early. It's in, it's in the laying of the foundations of factual embodied religion, and it's in Abraham's life. Yeah, you, it's very difficult to get around that, and, and the New Testament authors, especially Paul, really bring that out. So just a couple comments here. We won't go to the text because we've already, we've already discussed. Um, uh, Paul says, it is not the faith. Oh, okay, sorry. This is my comment. It is not that faith was not present prior to the patriarch. So again, I want to stress, Hebrews 11 says that Abel had faith, Noah had faith. So it's not that faith wasn't present. It's just faith, it's, it's, faith is revealed. Again, distinguish between revelation and redemption. Okay, redemption happens. The first promise of, of, of redemption is in Genesis 3. And so people are exercising faith after the promise of redemption. So Seth exercised faith. Eve exercises faith. Adam exercises faith. Noah exercises faith. But it's not until the, the explicit revelation of faith revealing in Abraham's life. God reveals that and shows that faith is necessary to be brought back into his presence and escape from final judgment. So it's faith is necessary. So we looked at Romans 4 already. Voss says faith bears twofold significance in scripture teaching and experience. Number one, dependence on the supernatural power and the grace of God. And number two, the state or act of projection into a higher spiritual world. That is a faith, that is the age to come. And so I would agree with that, although. Um, I would want to really emphasize, number one, um, the dependence on the supernatural power and grace of God. Does anyone want to add a comment? There's a lot of information here. What I'll do is I'll share my PowerPoints. I, I will also write down your notes. Don't, don't stop writing. I want you to ex experience the writing. But if you miss something because of the time, I will also share our, my, my PowerPoints. But I want you to experience the, the joy of writing. That, that's getting you more interaction with the content. Well, Tim, does this mean you don't have to be a Christian to be dependent on the supernatural power and grace of God? Okay, so, no, it does. It does, it, because he clarifies it, the age to come. So, okay. the eternal age to come, yeah, that's why, that's why I'm saying I don't like his wording, but, but this is true, that, that in, in faith, we are experiencing, we're part of, when we, when we attach ourselves to Christ, we are automatically a part of the age to come because he is already the new creation. So that's what Voss is trying to say, to, to say there. You know, so I just, yeah, like what you're saying, it's, it's a little confusing. So maybe we can say this is the state or, or act of projection into the, the, the real world, the age to come. Let's, let's say that because that's real. This is, this is a shadow. This is a type. This is fading away. This is passing away. Okay. This age is passing away. We're, we're, we are now partakers of the age to come. So 
when we exercise faith, we are brought into that reality. The old, the old has passed away, the new has come. There's so many passages that we could look at. We just, we just don't have the time. For us, though, for us, though, um, if you look at, again, looking at Hebrews 11, it'll talk about that Abraham was looking at that distant, that distant city, that, that city whose maker and builder is God. The, 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 the city who has, it's, it's the heavenly Jerusalem, okay? So again, in principial form, the principle of faith, persevering faith, active faith is found in uh, Genesis with the patriarchs. That, that's the big takeaway for, for the history of Revelation that we're bringing out. So just again, to go ahead, yeah. I uh, um, just want to ask certain is if 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 Voss was implying a already not yet scatological framework. Uh, oh this. yeah, yeah. He has a he is the founder of already not yet. He he is the he is the founder and the the explainer of already not yet. So yes, right. you you can be assured that he is for sure thinking about that. He right. was the one that emphasized the New Testament is thoroughly eschatological. His big thing was also that every doctrine in the New Testament has eschatological uh, saturation with it. And so everyone who speaks about that already not yet, the eschatological nature of all the, all the doctrines, that's from Voss. So Lad, Lad's depending that, on Voss. Huh? I thought it was George Ladd because, you know. No, <laughs> no and that's, that's, that, that's what's so sad. Everyone looks at George Ladd. They look at, you know, in the dispensationalism, they look at Bach and Blasing. They've all copied Lad. I mean, they've all copied Voss. That's why Voss is our textbook. Voss, and later we'll look at we'll look at we'll look at those things. Um, Voss is Voss. It's a hard read. I, I, I don't deny it. it's a hard read, but it's that's like it's so fundamental. Okay, let's go. We will get there. Actually, I'm thinking about a class in the fall, and we're actually going to probably do Pauline theology, Pauline theology. So. We will, we will continue Voss's study now. We will really focus on New Testament, the, the theology of Paul. I think you will really like that class. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to be offering our one class. The one big class I will teach in the fall will be Paul, Pauline theology. So we have the biblical theological framework, and then that's setting us up for Pauline theology. So I think that it's going to be a beautiful thing. So um, uh, enroll, enroll soon. <laughs> no, we'll, 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 we'll make that plan in the summer, but that's where I think we're going with, with the next class that we'll be teaching here. It'll be a nice segue from biblical theology. Okay, next we have here ethical elements. So not only is there, number one, we have election. Number two, we have objectivity. The principle. So number one, we had the principle of election. Number two, we had the, the, the principle of objectivity of the gifts. Number three, we have supernaturally pro supernatural promises fulfilled supernaturally. I'm sorry, that was bad English. Uh, number four, we have faith, persevering faith. Number five, we have the name of God. Number six, we have transformed life. So we have transformed life. We also have faith. Number seven, ethical elements. So if, if ever, if ever you're saying Abraham had a different ethic than us, it wasn't so big. It wasn't so big. <laughs> Let's examine now Genesis 18, 16 to 18. If ever, if ever. Here we go. I'm, I'll read this, and as I read, I'll talk through it. Then the men sent out from there, and they looked down towards Sodom. So this is the, this is the angels of the Lord. These are the, the men there. There's actually three of them. Interesting. Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? So this is the men. So this would be, again, the, 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 the Lord is revealing, is, is, is revealing himself through these men. To, but it's, it's the Lord's presence. Shall I hide what I'm about to do from Abraham, seeing that Abraham shall? So this is a repetition of the pro, of Abraham uh, promise. So Abraham will, this is a promise, become a great nation, right? Promise number one. And all the earth will be blessed by him. So this, what, what context what context is this is behind this this passage here what what passage of scripture does this sound just like uh, genesis genesis yeah genesis 12 
Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Diba? I will make you a great nation, a great name. And in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So this is really, this is, this is a restatement. Restatement. Okay, everyone sees that? And if you recall there, I mentioned about election. I mentioned that there's election there, and maybe it wasn't so clear and it got calling. But look, look, at, look at how election comes out. Does anyone see the election in verse number 19? Where is the election? I have chosen. Ah. Tim, Tim. Go ahead. Uh, this is just the observation. It, it's related to what I've said earlier because yeah. the way God said it, it's it's like appealing, <laughs> appealing to how would, how would you put it? It's like it's constructed in a way that becomes appealing on the part of uh, Abraham to accept this kind of uh, covenant or something. Isn't that right? You so, shall be, you shall surely become a great nation. It's appealing to him. But at the end of the day, it's God's, it, that, the, way, the way God looks at it in the future, it's still its own a purpose that is being, uh, how you put that? Yeah. But, but can, I, can I push back again a little bit on that, Ray? Ray, we okay. all are men, right? We all are men. All of us have, right, Diba? All of us want to do it ourselves. So there is some things that are incentivized by us. Maybe God offers us something. But at the end of the day, we all want to be autonomous. We want to do it ourselves, right? We are pr proud men. We can do it. We can build it, right? And so there is a sense in which absolutely this is, this is very much uh, a benefit. But, but that's what everyone's trying to do here. These men are very strong. They're self-autonomous. And... And maybe this is a different construct today, Ray. Like in American context, you, so maybe this is a different culture too. In American context, Americans do not want anything to be given to them. They hate being given stuff. They will do it themselves. Boy, speak for me. You know it's yeah. true. This is the American yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. That's why. That's why I'm, I'm going to, that's why come, something come up with the question of Ray. Suppose Ray, somebody tells you, Ray, you will be the next president of the Philippines. Would you believe Obviously, at the, at the start, you won't believe because you won't see the truth. But, but, the, but Abraham the, believed. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the difference, Ray? What's the difference between you and Abraham because of that very, very impossible situation? Well, the thing is, it's God speaking and you, it's you speaking. <laughs> No, 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 it's not me. I'm just giving you an example. Suppose God... But if, so, if, if, God if, if it would be God telling me directly that, Ray, you will become president in the next few years, then definitely I'm going to believe God. <laughs> Joke like we have. <laughs> yeah. It may, be, it may be a preposterous <laughs> illustration, but my point there is, without the faith, element of faith, everything somebody says will be nothing. That's, that's the point. Yeah, but, 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 but Ray, the other thing too is that for, for you again, because you are Christian, it's easy for, maybe in one sense, it's easy for you to believe, Diba. But for, for Abraham, he, he had his own, he had Ishmael. <laughs> he recommended Eliezer. Eliezer is my, he's, a, he's in my house. Let him be the heir. So, so, you know, I do, I, I, do, I think, I mean, it's easy for us to look back as God fearers, as God believers, and say, oh, God said it. But, when you're in the moment, Diba Ray, if you had the vision that God said you'd be present, maybe you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I wouldn't believe. I yeah. wouldn't believe. <laughs> Bert, Tim, is, is there any, any text or book that at least somehow Abraham has an idea or concept about God? Because, you know, at, at some point, he believed it was, it was God telling him. Right, but because this, early, early yeah. part of the history of mankind, there was already the presence of God telling people, especially from Abraham. So at some point, Abraham had an idea who God is. That's why he yeah. believed him. But 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 so but so here's the thing, Ray. I'm gonna I'm gonna get I'm gonna I'm gonna poke a little bit again. Again, the presupposition is that Abraham has the ability to believe on his own. What we're trying to say here is that no, nothing. Nothing that no one. If if we were in Abraham's shoes, if you or I or anyone else. Even if it was just Abraham by himself, he would not have believed. 
What happened behind in Abraham's heart was God gave him the faith. The spirit worked in his life. He was chosen by God. And, and that's, what, that's what Voss is saying. The, the supernatural grace overcame what was in man, mankind's heart. So, so no one, what, 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 what Koi Bull was trying to say, what I'm trying to say, what others, what the, what the scripture says is that no one would believe of our own volition. It was a supernatural revelation of God. God worked in his life to give him the faith to believe, Ray. That, that, that's, the, that, that's the, because you're saying it has to be, and I'm saying, no, no, no one would believe. It's ridiculous. No one would believe. That's where we have to come to that place, Ray. That's where we have to come to that place. Uh, yeah. Boy. That's, yeah. I'm that's why, that's why, that's why Boss uh, emphasized that because of the supernaturalism of these events, it makes it possible for us to believe that somewhere behind this is God. Otherwise, there's no sense. It Why would no the sense. supernatural thing happen if there's somebody, if there's not somebody as powerful as God doing all these things yeah. behind? Yeah. That's why he emphasized that supernatural. That's how I, I understood the supernaturalism yeah. aspect of both description of all these yeah. things behind. I said I uh, I said earlier that you know God's you know verbal revelations to to Abraham is is I think okay this is my my what what I think that it's 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 uh you know super sur surpassing the the natural phenomenon uh it it provokes probably it, I would use the provokes or it it is impossible in the gods of Abraham Abraham before he was called by God to their their gods won't won't reveal to them but here comes God revealed verbally to to Abraham and then this word from God really provokes i mean really encourage or, or, or fake the or whatever you you want to, yeah. to to term it that that makes abraham believe so yeah, there must but, there must be a word and then after after the utterance believe but it's like but, what, but so, so the thing. but the word the word came to cain and cain did not cain did not cain went his way so it's, it, that's why what we always say, what I'm saying, what the Word of God is saying, it's more than just even a supernatural revelation, which 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 got which causes Abraham to believe. There's a, a there's a supernatural work in the heart of Abraham yeah. to, to to give him the faith to believe, because it's the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yeah. No one would believe. Th that's yeah, where we have. To, that's where we have to get to. Yeah. I mean, faith is a gift from God. <laughs> Yeah, in short, Tim, it's not really all about Abraham's story. It was really God prompting him to do it, something exactly. like that. Exactly. No, exactly right. Because it's, it's, and it's, we, it's yeah. yeah. And Kuya Buboy, if God prompts me to run for president, then I will be president. <laughs> <clears throat> but, 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 Ray, he, he promises you to be president, but you can't do anything. You're just going to sit yeah. there. <laughs> you be like you're crazy. You're crazy. <laughs> you gotta give up. But you don't have to go. The, 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 going down the street. The, the, the. <laughs> anyway, this is this is. I hope this is revolutionary because this this shows just we, the response that we should have is maybe tears and just God. All the glory belongs to God. God is the all-wise creator of the universe, and he deserves our praise. He deserves our worship. And whatever he calls us to do, we should do it no matter how hard, because he is worthy. He has opened our eyes to the gospel. He has lifted the veil. He has lifted the veil, 2 Corinthians 3, so that we have seen the glory of, 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 of the Son of God in our hearts. He's shown his light. Um, the same God that called light out of darkness has shown the light of the gospel in our heart. And that, that is a supernatural work that we should never take. We should never take lightly. Anyway, the show must go on. We have to continue here. Okay, so uh, look at this. So we have election here. It's there. Election. So if ever you doubted, it's there. You uh, choose to elect. But look, look at, look at what he says. There wasn't really ethics before, but look what he says, that he may command, that he may command his children, his household after him, to what? What are they to do? They are to keep the way of the Lord 
Look at the ethics. Doing righteousness and justice. Doing righteousness and justice. So this is looking and anticipating law and, and God's eternal moral law. So this is the law and the eternal law. So we could talk about the new covenant law as well, but also the Mosaic law here. So it's including what I'm trying to get at. It, it, it includes everything. That's this idea here. So what we want to see here is this is the ethics. This is the ethics. So liberals will want to talk about, oh, there wasn't really, you know, there wasn't really ethics in the Genesis. No, there is. Doing righteousness and justice. Doing righteousness and justice. So it's in fundamental form. It's in principial form. Now we need to read along further to, to get to all those details. Now for sure, Abraham sinned. Jacob had four wives. But we know that we know that that true righteousness and justice existed here because number one, Cain killed his brother and it was sin and he was he was he was granted mercy but he was still cursed, um, and 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 Joseph refused to have sex with Potiphar's wife. <laughs> that would not have been a, well for Joseph. It would have been sexual immorality, not adultery, but it would have been adultery, right? So so we so. The ethics is there, even if they're sinners, even if they're breaking, even if they're not faithful, the ethics is there. The ethics is there. And then looking down here, their sin is grave. It's great. So again, sin is present. Righteousness, true righteousness and justice is present. So we cannot say there's a different righteousness. We cannot say that we cannot say that the, um, the you know, they, they didn't have the law, so how could God hold them accountable? It's there. It's present. From creation, it's present. It's there. Okay, Question, let's go please. back. Yeah, go ahead. Question, yeah, go ahead. Before we go, since we are, we are doing, we are now dealing with this ethical aspect of uh, God's command, and the Israelites will have, were having this practice of marrying somebody within the family as long as they are not of the same mother and the same father yeah and then the practice of some of the patriarchs even to have one of their maids to be their uh, wife that's like what yeah. happened yeah. to rebecca and yeah. i mean uh jacob and the other two yeah. Yeah. Uh, maids of his two wives Leia and Rachel. So yeah. when when did this actually start? Because God did not tell them to, you can have that uh, many wives. When did that start? It's not clear how both uh, related this yeah. uh, kind of yeah. uh, ethical violation of the patriarchs. Yeah, so what I what I would say is is it's explicit in Genesis 2, 23 and 24. Therefore shall a man leave his mother and his father his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. So there at the very beginning, marriage is clear. It's, 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 it's sacred. It's pure. Jesus looks back and says, it's not the case. Jesus does give us a, a glimpse into why, into why God allowed it. He says that they said, well, what about Moses? The bill, the, 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 the divorce. Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness of the heart of people. And so what I would say is that due to the hardness of, 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 of just sin and just the, the, the depravity of mankind, that was one of those things that God did not excuse, but he overlooked the Bible. Because remember, common grace, the, 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 the covenant of Noah allows him to move forward with the promises of redemption and, and not overlooking that he won't eventually punish, but allowing man to live. Um, in a state of sin. And so that would be one of those we see if we were to do a biblical theology of marriage, boy, we see so much corruption in marriage from, from Genesis 3 moving forward, from Genesis 3 moving forward. And so we'd, we would want to look at all of that and we'd, we'd, we'd see how sin and, and, and the curse corrupted marriage and then how it's being brought back, it's being redeemed 
in the church, Viba. And so marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. So yeah, my short, I guess I, my, my answer is we don't know all those other details. Uh, we know there is more explanation in the law. Um, whole lot of sinning. Yeah, because in, in, even in some religion like the Muslim, they practice that. They use that as yeah. an excuse. Yeah. So what I would say is Genesis is descriptive, not prescriptive. Maybe that gets to what you're saying. Uh, you're asking, Koya Boy Boy. Genesis is descriptive, not prescriptive. And, and I think, Ray, you've heard me say that before. That is to say that Genesis merely describes what happened, but it wasn't giving a prescription of what should be. So there is a lot of things that the patriarchs did that God did not condone. So we can't just say, oh, because the patriarchs practice it, it must be okay. Yeah, we, we could not say that. It's just describing what happened, not prescribing what should happen. De definitely it should be just descriptive because the moment you have plenty of wives definitely there's going to be a quarrel yeah. in the home yeah well for sure for sure genesis 2 23 24 it's it's any polygamy is is is, is banned it's it's adultery so um let's look at some concluding points by voss the main virtues are so these are virtues emphasized in the patriarch lives hospitality magnet mag I don't, even know. I don't even know what that word is so that's what boss says i'd like to try to say it magna magnanimity magnanimity, magnanimity. yeah so i'm not anyone want to take a crack at what that means i don't know what that means i, I forgot to look it up like uh, it's like saying team the i i won in the election because i am magnanimous i say it's not me it's it's the effort of somebody oh. else that's so maybe like magnanimous. humble like 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 maybe yeah, humility, yeah. humility okay so great you do, not, you do not you do not get the credit for for the for the for the accomplishment Siggy, Siggy. that's good that's good okay i like that okay so let's go with that um self-sacrifice loyalty so we see all that we see that in we see that in there but voss brings out that that ultimately the focus of Abraham's religious favor with God is that they are keeping, so this is, we can say doing righteousness and justice. Another way of saying it is keeping the way of Jehovah, keeping the way of the Lord, however that looks. True righteousness and justice. Everything, if we are practicing true righteousness and justice, that's a catch-all for everything. And so then Voss will also talk about the ethical character of OT religion is symbolized by circumcision. Now, why or how is it circum, uh, symbolized in circumcision? And Voss explains, circumcision was the removal of uncleanliness. So we don't really have, uh, maybe you do. Filipinos have, you get circumcised later in life. We get circumcised very early, okay? But Diba, th there is a lot of uncleanliness. You have to be very careful. I will, I will be, try to be discreet here, but, but uh, there's a lot of uncleanliness if you're not careful with uncircumcision, right? So you have extra, you know, it's mixed company there, but, but most of you can figure it out. It, it, because you're removing extra skin, there's a lot of like dirt and there's even sometimes there's smell. And so, so this symbolism of circumcision, number one, it's bloody. And number two, it's the removal of uncleanliness. And so this is why in the scripture, Paul, uh, going to Romans 4, 9 to 12 and Colossians 2, 11 to 13 is the greater reality, circumcision of the heart, removing the dirt, the, 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 the evil in the heart. So this is, this is part of the ethical element. So in the Abrahamic covenant, the physical token is the circumcision. That's going to point to the greater reality, the, circ the need for us to be circumcised of the heart and even Moses will say that the children of Israel need to be circumcised in their hearts in order for them to obey the word of God. Okay, so um, this is the ethical element here. Go ahead. Topic of circumcision. Yeah. The, the, the account of both says that circumcision was practiced even outside of the Israeli yeah. community. Yeah. So the, I, I was just intrigued. Why, why God would use such practice uh, from a pagan from a pagan community and use it on his people probably because so the there's also animal sacrifices practiced by pagans too so so what i would say is is that um 
uh, most likely there are these because God, so this comes back to natural, natural revelation. Henry likes this natural revelation. Okay. There are fundamental concepts that God teaches us through nature. So I would say that that sacrifice, animal sacrifice, blood, the sacrifice through blood, and probably even circumcision teaches us truths uh, that, 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 that special revelation confirms. So if we, all we had was natural revelation, we, were, we wouldn't really see it. But with special revelation, we see that. And so I'd say circumcision would be a truth that because just by nature, it's very dirty. It's, it's naturally dirty. Even, even washing, all the pagan nations practice washing. Hindus practice washing, cleansing, cleansing the body. Judaism practices washing. So these are these concepts, these physical concepts are teaching us spiritual truths. So, so um, I would not at all be surprised that a lot of these concepts are practiced by everyone else because these, these are just like righteousness, right? So there is other people, they wouldn't just murder people post 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 uh, Babel, you know, many cultures are against murder, right? You know, there, there are other monogamous uh, countries that practice monogamy, right? So, so these are, these are ethical elements, because remember, God's law is written on all of our hearts, diva. So from the beginning of time, Paul says in, in Romans 2, uh, 11 to 14, that the Gentiles have the law written on our hearts. So I would expect all of these practices now they're corrupt and we would not say that there's any merit, there's no merit, but they're trying to reach out to God even with corrupt values because that's how they were created. We still have the image of God and everyone is trying in one sense or another, they have that longing for God. They have that desire even though it's been corrupted. So that would be my, my, my answer, Koi Boboy. Now, some people don't like that. And, and there, there's other people, a con, some conservatives say there's no, that's not, that's just liberal. That's liberal. It's not real. Their circumcision was only practiced by Israel. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's debated. It's but, so what's your point? What's your stand on that theme? I say personally, I, what I understand really is it's exclusively for Jews when they have that practice. Yeah. So, so, so th it is factual that other, I think Egyptians would also practice, they would be circumcised. So, um, so then did they get it from Israel or did Israel? So I haven't really studied it. So I would say that I'm willing to, for me, I'm willing to accept that. I'm willing to accept that, that it wasn't uniquely practiced. The, the practice is, so this specific in relationship to the covenant, it's connected with the promise of Abraham. So no one else could just practice it. Just practicing it itself does not make them a child of Abraham. So just so just to be clear, it's in yeah. the context of the the promise. So, right. go ahead, Sunny. Uh, yeah, it's not really. Uh, I would say it's not really unique by practice in ancient Near Eastern or during that time, right? Even even the suzerain and vassals, they like you know cutting the birds and then. Um, you know, pledging to your kings and, uh, and the servant kings pledge to one another, let it be uh, done it to me, the, the cutting. It's actually uh, practices also in other nations. What, what is unique here in my, in my own, uh, at least my, my stand, what is being unique here is that it's not the king, it's not a human king who said it, it's, it's the God, it's Yahweh himself who told it. That's, that's the, I think, the divine, there is a unique di a divine uniqueness there. But the practice or, you know, the, the, the practice that is very common was even used. But the, the one who declares is God himself, not, not the king or not the human king. Yeah, so that, that, that would be, yeah, that, that, that's, that's what Sonny's saying. I, I agree with that as well. Again, I think that like sacrifice so everyone practices sacrifice. You know, now in our modern country, we, our modern Judeo-Christian context, we don't. But all, all countries, all religions practice sacrifice because they're trying to uh, atone for their sin. Because again, the, the, the guilt is present in their heart. So I would expect similar things like this to be done. And, and part of it is that God said it, but other part of it too is the promise. So the covenant 
the, 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 the circumcision is a sign of the promise. So anyone can be circumcised if they're not part of the promise. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. Just like you could, we could go out and, and, and they could go out and, and sacrifice all the bulls they want, right? Sacrifice the bulls and goats I do not desire, but a body that's prepared for me, right? So, so, so God doesn't care about the, the inward has to be connected with the outward. The faith of Abraham has to be connected with the outward sign of circumcision. So, Pastor Tim, yeah. Cyrus here. Hi, Cyrus. Uh, just on the lighter side, uh, with regard to the circumcision, I think it's not for everyone in the Old Testament. I mean, they could do that. But like in Genesis chapter 34, when uh, one uh, the only daughter of Jacob was raped, her name yeah. is Dina. Yeah. And Shechem was, and his men were, yeah were convinced to you know to join them and have yeah. you know and to follow the circumcision rites so it was detrimental or you know it, it led to their demise because the sons of jacob like slaughtered them literally like all of them yeah. the, uh, yeah. the whole tribe so it was really tragic for them so um no, actually, this makes uh, this is just an additional information. Yeah, no, it's a good. No, that's a, yeah, that's that's a great observation. So what Cyrus is saying is that the the men of Shechem they were evil in their heart. They took circumcision, didn't help them, didn't do anything. They weren't part of the promise, and that's I really agree with that. Of course, Jacob's sons are terrible. I mean, everyone was sinning. They were sinning against Dinah. She, he, they responded in, in sin. Um, but yeah, the, the the circumcision is always connected with the promise. And, 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 and it's also connected fundamentally with faith in the heart. So that's why someone who's an Israelite that takes the seal, Paul says, if they don't have faith, their circumcision becomes uncircumcised. <laughs> and the uncircumcised who do, who do the works of the law, their uncircumcision becomes circumcision. So it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, circumcision is just an outward sign pointing to inward and eternal realities. So we have to, we, yeah, Bobo, go ahead. Yeah, my additional observation to the example of Cyrus there. They use circumcision as a deception to kill yeah. an uh, atom for, I mean, as a revenge. <laughs> he, for yes. Their, for their children. So yes, that's right. uh, we could not, we could not connect that circumcision in, in this, in the sense that we yeah. are discussing. It was just used as a means to yeah. weaken the enemy because when you are uh, under circumcision, you cannot move. Uh, that freely and you are not that strong. That's why. Yes, that's why I said, yeah. I think that's what <laughs> they got. They, they had infections and that they was were the wrong way. unable to to defend themselves. Yeah. 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 No, that's good. Yeah. So, needless to say, what we can say here is there is ethical elements, and those ethical elements are are the same in principial form as what's ethically demanded by God up until what climax is in Christ. Okay. So that's what we're trying to get at. Okay. E ethics does not change is what we're, we're trying to go there. Okay. That, that's the big takeaway. Um, okay. We're almost done. What time is it now? It is okay. Three minutes. We started late. So I'm still, I'm right on the money. I'm right on the money here. Here we go. We're almost done. Sintra. Oh my goodness. I did not. Okay. We're going to do this. This is, this is the climax. Okay. This is the climax here. We're going to go to two texts and we'll be done. The centrality of the of the of the the sacrifice. Let's examine Genesis 22. I saw this by Voss. I hope all of us saw this. This was so revolutionary for me. But look at this connection that Voss makes. I, I got goosebumps. I maybe even was I was I was I got a little bit teary eyed. I just this is amazing. Let's look at let's look at let's compare Genesis 22. And, and Romans 8, 32 to 39, okay? So let's go first to Genesis 22. Look at this. I've never seen this before in my life. It's there. It's in the text. It's so powerful. So this is, this is the proclamation in token form of Christ's sacrifice in the future. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven saying, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here am I. Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. So this is when he's going to sacrifice Isaac. For now, I know that you fear God. Look at this. So this is the test. This is probation. This is another probation 
before he receives the promise. Uh, I'm sorry, this is wrong here. And this is the reason. This is the explanation. For now I know that you that you fear God. Now watch this. Seeing, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So, so Abraham does not withhold his son, his only son, from, from uh, the sacrifice. Now, was it just for God to demand that Abraham give Isaac? And, and what's your biblical basis for that? I just don't want to hear it's God's purpose. I want to hear a biblical reason. Why was it just for God asking Abraham to sacrifice his firstborn? I want to know a biblical reason why. It's revealed later. There's a reason why. Why was it just in God asking for the life of, of Isaac, the son of Jacob? I need a biblical reason. Uh, yes. Okay, I'm saying that's what, it is a test, but I also want to see beyond the test because people say it's a crazy. It's a crazy test. God is malicious. What? John what 316, I can only think of John 316. Okay, go ahead. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed will not perish and have yeah. eternal life. No, okay, that's good. That's good. So, so it's foreshadowing the, the death yeah. of Jesus, which is good. But my question is, on what basis theologically does God have the right to ask for Abraham's son? And it's not, it's not, because we, we would just say it's flippant. Why is he asking for the son? He doesn't have a, why, what is the, what is the basis? Does anyone, does anyone have one? Yeah, go ahead. Um, in Leviticus. Go ahead, where read God, it. Where God, where God proclaimed that all firstborn are for him. Yes. Do you have the passage? Yeah, I don't know exactly where in Leviticus, uh, but I read it before. Yes, um, uh, I, I did not write this down. I thought I wrote it down. It's the wrong passage. Um, hold on here. Um, so I will post the passage. I, I'm shooting myself. I did not double check, and the, the reference I wrote down is wrong. In Leviticus, the Lord requires a sacrifice for the, the a, a tithe for the firstborn. And if you won't give the tithe, you're to break the neck. Because all, everything that comes out of the womb is mine. <laughs> so Isaac is the Lord's. He had every right to ask for it. Why? Because he is the creator. So um, all the firstborns from the womb are the Lord's. This is going to kill me. I'm going to look this up right now. I, I just, I am embarrassed. Please forgive me. I should have, I should have done a better job here. This is uh, in, in, in Genesis chapter four, every first fruit of the product of the produce is offered to the Lord. So it was okay. Yeah. yeah, no, that's really good. So that's the prototype. That's an excellent observation. Henry, you get you get the gold star. That is really good. I like that so much. Let me find the reference though. Let me find Numbers so, three thirteen. Okay, Numbers three thirteen. Read it. Read it to me. For all the firstborn are mine. When I struck down all the firstborn born in Egypt, I set apart for myself every firstborn in Israel, whether human or animal. They are to be mine. I am the Lord. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Exodus. Exodus uh, 4.22, 23. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn. <laughs> so this was, a, this was, this is crazy. Okay, so the Lord had every right to ask of this, because at the end of the day, thank you, Claude. Thank you, Cloyd, for, for that. Maybe, maybe Cloyd read that. Um, thank you for that. Excellent, excellent job. God had every right, Exodus 13, 2 as well. Yes, there's several of them. God had every right to do this because 
Every firstborn is the Lord's. He is the creator. Now, this was what I never saw before. And this just gave me goosebumps. So sacrifice is central in Genesis. We see it climax in the exchange of, of, of Abraham's son for the goat, okay? For the ram in the thicket, not, not the goat, the ram, okay? Look at, look at Romans 8.31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So remember, Abraham did not withhold his, his son, his only son. Now I know that you fear me. Look at this. This is just gives me goosebumps. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. So what I want us to see here is that number one, of course, of course, God has the right to do that. But number two, it's going along the lines of what Koya Boy said. And we see this explicit here that, that God was calling Abraham to do this because this was a picture. This was a token for us that one day God will in fact give over his son to us. And so we see in Genesis 22, the gospel. In Genesis 22, the gospel. There, the, the, there is one comment, Tim, that this, this, this event was the beginning of the principle of substitution. Is that correct? Yes. So yes, as well. Now you have it in principial form in Genesis 1 to 11, but explicitly the principle of sacrifice and substitution. Yes, excellent. Sacrifice and substitution. Excellent. This is the principle. Team? Go ahead. Just a thought. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, I, I know if, if God acts on it, like yeah, getting the firstborn, but would it be considered as murder on the part of <laughs> Abraham for doing it? No, and why? 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 Why can? Why must we say no? Because, because God commanded it. <laughs> no, because God is the Creator. He is the Creator. It's not wrong for God to take life or to give life. He is the Creator. He but, gives and He takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But, the correct but the, term for that ray is parricide, not murder. It's parricide. Uh, paris, yeah, parricide. Thank you, Kuya Bumoy. I mean, we we have that, like. I don't know if you're getting me, Tim, no? Because if you, if you act, out, act it out, it, it, it's, it's you who is doing it. It's not God. But if God, like, destroying people through his power, then that's a, another thing. So I don't know. No, no, be, be, no because, because, because as a messenger on behalf of someone, the messenger is not punished. He is just acting upon for the king. So, for example, Israel, Pastor Henry and I talked about this, Diba. Uh, Israel is sent down to Egypt, and they're going to wait there 400 years, and then God is going to bring them back because the sins of the Amorites are not yet complete. And when he brings them back, he destroys and punishes the Canaanites for their sin, but God punishes them through his, by giving the land to, 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 to Canaan. So, Israel is the judgment of God upon the Canaanites. So but maybe between man and man, you could say that, uh, but, but from God, it's different. Maybe, maybe that's the distinction you'd want to make. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, team. No, no problem, no problem. It's crazy, you know, but this comes back to if we have a man-centered theology where we're focused on man and that man is really good and that we have all these things owed and that God owes us all these things, many of these things become hard. If we have a God-centered theology that God is perfect, he's sinless, man is corrupt, he's sinful, he's breaking God's law, then it makes a whole lot more sense and, it's, and everything's reconcilable. So this, this really comes back to a biblical theological framework and it comes back to a God-centered theology. And so I really want, I hope that you can see that tonight. And um, the last point, which we just don't have time to go to, is the, the persistent uh, prayer and faith that, that Jacob exercised when he wrestled with God. And um, so I hope that we can see, we'll just end it here. 
and we'll close in prayer. I hope that we can see, I hope that all of us can see that in, in, um, in if big, this is big picture here. Okay. Big picture. Genesis one, Genesis one and two, we have, we have, um, natural revelation. We have special revelation, the covenant of Abraham, a uh, covenant of, 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 of Adam. We have the first, uh, pre-redemptive. Then we have the, 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 the first redemptive revelation divides. There's four principles, life, probation, testing, temptation, and then death. Then we had the big revelation from four to, to nine, which is just man's absolute corrupt depravity. Then we have these, these blessed statements of God choosing still a, a, a family, the, the, the Shemites, between nine to 11. And then from chapter 12, from chapter 12 to 50, you have God choosing a, a family by which he's going to bless all of the nations. And within that family, <clears throat> in the patriarchs, we have uh, nine, nine principles. Perhaps we could bring up another one, but you have nine principles of, of, of true embodied religion true embodied religion. So just like those principles in the first redemption are going to be played out throughout all of redemptive history, just like the revelation of God, uh, of man's corrupt nature is played out through redemptive history. Now we have the, the, the embodiment of factual religion and these principles that again are going to be played out through all religion, uh, through all redemptive history. So coming to the New Testament, there's just more revelation and explanation of what's already been there. I really... I really hope that everyone sees this. This is not new or different. It's just further re revealing and explaining. And it's all within this redemptive historical framework, history of redemption, history of revelation. We're focusing on history of revelation, okay? Uh, let's close in prayer. I'm sorry I kept you a little bit long. I know you're tired. Um, for those in, for those in, uh, CGST and in the MAT program, uh, one of the requirements is, is a midterm exam, okay? I will send out a, uh, more information on that. It will be a take-home exam, which will really be covering a lot of what we've already discussed in class. So I will, I will share my PowerPoints. Um, I have to confirm what I can allow you to use with, with CGST. But my point is not to kill you or to make it uh, insanely difficult for you. So I will have probably three or four or maybe five essay questions of you explaining what we've already discussed. Okay, so maybe I'll say, what are the four principles of first, of first redemption? Explain and, and use some examples in the rest of scripture. Okay, so you'll have to label the, the four principles in first redemption, and then give me some examples. So it'll be questions like that. Um, I want to say, I said three to five questions. I just don't, I have to confirm with, with CGST. It'll probably be between five to 10, but if you're paying attention in class, you have notes, um, I will allow you to use resources to, to, to work through that. I'm not trying to kill you. I'm not trying to make it difficult. I do want you to really reflect and, and to put into practice what we've been taught. So I will send out more information. Um, a due date will probably be in like one and a half weeks. So I'll share information tomorrow on that, on that midterm exam, but it's only for MAT students. Okay. So if you're in the CT program, you don't have to worry about it. If you're auditing it, you don't have to worry about it. It's just for the CGST and the MAT students. And again, I'm not trying to beat you up, you know, um, so uh, I'll send out more information and you'll have time. And the other thing too is I won't put a time limit. Maybe I'll say you have to write down how much time you spend doing the, the midterm, but I'm not, it's, it'll be a take home midterm. It, it won't be, it won't be, um, it, I, I don't, I don't want time to be a factor and testing a time should not be a factor. Okay. So I'll share more information with you. If you have questions, we can, uh, you can reach out to me one-on-one -on -one and we can deal with the questions. So I'll share information either tomorrow or Wednesday, and then you'll have like one to two weeks to complete but it will be sudden death. You have to get it back to me because I have to submit the grade by March 31st. So, so you will have, there will be a due date. And if you don't turn it in, sayang. So the blessing is you can, it's a take home test. There'll be a pledge. The downside is it's sudden death. So get it, get it done and get it back to me. Okay. Um, 
All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. I'm going to go ahead and close this in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your grace. I thank you for all that you've given to us, that you've given us this revelation. Father God, I pray that we would submit to you in all things. We would submit to your word. We would read your word as, as subjects to it, that we would grow in grace. Father, I just thank you for this great time of being able to study and to discuss and to give some pushback and for iron sharpening iron. I pray that you would strengthen us, you'd guide us, and that you would just really lift us up. Father God, I, I pray that you'd bless each one of the students here, protect them, guide them. May we grow together. And Father God, I just pray that you would grant us persevering faith, that we would cling to you, your gospel, and the promises that you have for us, for your glory, not for ourselves. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen.